Welcome to the Phone Play YouTube channel, Open Mic Edition. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Open Mic number 120. We just literally got the document. Jinx was able to get us the document from the KZ's file. So uh, we're going to say quick hellos, and we're going to get a 46-page document or 43-page document, whatever. Um, 46 pages, I think, and um, probably 40 or so pages of reading. So let's say hello to everyone, and we're going to get rolling uh, here relatively quick. So first up, we have Alice. Uh, hi, everyone on panel. Hi, everyone in chat. Looking forward to this. Let's get rolling. And then uh, who we have here? We have, uh, um, we have Susan. How you doing, Susan? I'm doing great. Hi, everybody. Excited to hear this. Let's get going. Absolutely. And then uh, we have uh, me. I'm doing great. Thanks. <laughs> And just run that. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. Uh, no. Hey, how's it going? Uh, excited. Excited to uh, to see what she's... I've read about four pages. Uh, it looks pretty interesting. So, ready to go. Let's go. Let's do it. And then, uh, member of the year, Foul Play member of the year, and document extraordinary grabber. She's the one that got us the document for today, so... Jinxie, how are you? Hello, everyone. I was on her site, and it said that it was uploaded, and I was clicking that link, and it was not the right link. I'm like, I'm here before KZ can get it even up. <laughs> but it was there, so yay. <laughs> Never leave. Oh, lady. Hello, everybody. I'm ready to go. Woohoo. Neverly's probably still doing surgery at work. Saffir cop, he's going to start us some reading here in a few minutes. How are you doing, sir? Oh, yeah, doing good. Been waiting for freaking something on this case for a while in between this and the, the Idaho case. Had enough going, I guess. There you go. Trail mix. I don't know if trail mix can talk, but. Okay, trail mix. I'm just going to listen. That's all. <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's not a problem. And Dr. Selman, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, thanks, Jack61, and welcome all fellow panel members and everyone in chat. Let's get the show on the road. Yep, and just uh, quickly here, we will say hello to our guest, and it looks like we have a, well, we've got quite a few. So we'll try to grab as many as we can here. There's Tuco, the lovely dark side, fangirl, TTM fangirl, uh, da, 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 da. We have Colette, Hydrax, Catnit, the lovely Catnit. Our two, are, our two super mods are here. Um, there's Pete Moss, Andy B. There's Jennifer, Jennifer Gowell. Hope I said that right. Graham Moss. Little scrolling, guys. There's Kay. Okay, I, I did get your message. I will try to find you an answer. I, don't, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, but uh, we'll see what we can find. Um, there's Stacy Seabrook. Hey, Stacy, thanks for coming. Really appreciate that. Uh, there's Lola, Lola Blue. Thanks, Lola, for coming. That's a new name for me. Um, I think I've got, oh, there's Case 10 reporting in from, uh, you know, way over there. <laughs> Frozen corn and the land of cornfields. It's, it's been cold and snowing here all day today. That's Carol. We've uh, got Clay. Yep, and Claire. Claire Cavanaugh. And Claire. Yep, Rod Old and Jason Bennett. And I think that's everybody. Yeah, I think you're right. Oh, Jeff Jones has joined us now as well. So is hey. our William. Hey. One. Hey, thanks for coming, hey. folks. Really appreciate it. We missed anybody? Jennifer as well. Jennifer Manning? Jennifer's just jumped in, yeah. Oh, sweet. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll read 
uh, sections and, and break. It's not going to be a straight reading, but it, we're going to read quite a bit and then break uh, so we can get through the you know this document. So with that said, I'm going to pull the document up. And we're going to get started. All right, that's going to pop in. Uh, this is a, yeah, it's 46 pages. I think Susan said there's something like 43. This is the state's, re uh, her reply to the state's reply. Uh, yeah, there you go. You can see it there. Mr. Avery replied to the state's response, opposing motion for an evidence hearing and post conviction relief under Wisconsin statute 97406. Um, <laughs> Yep, uh, uh, Saffir Kopp has offered to lend his voice for some, his excellent voice for, voice for some reading. He doesn't have to read the entire thing, so you read as much as you want. Uh, you know, we, there may be a break in here or there, but uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let you, I'm just going to let you read. And if you want to stop, if you see something that, uh, you know, piques your interest, whatever, stop. It's fine. Yeah, so we'll you, do. yep, you just take off and read whenever you're ready. All right. <clears throat> Defendant Stephen Avery, that's Mr. Avery to you guilters, by his undersigned attorneys, Kathleen Zellner and Associates and Stephen G. Richards, for his reply to the state's response in opposition to his motion for an evidentiary hearing and post-conviction relief states as follows. Introduction. The state has presented an argument designed to obfuscate the significance of Mr. Avery's powerful new evidence that Bobby Dassey, heretofore Bobby, had the opportunity and is directly connected to actually murdering Teresa Halbach, hereby Ms. Halbach, and to planning the forensic evidence to frame Mr. Avery because he was observed pushing her vehicle, which contained her blood spattered in the rear cargo area and door, onto the Avery salvage yard in the middle of the night, planning it where it would be easily discovered the next day. The RAV4 contained evidence of the violence inflicted on Ms. Halbach, her clothing and personal effects, blood, and the forensic evidence that was used to convict Bobby's uncle, Mr. Avery, of Ms. Halbach's murder. Uh, Bobby's possession of the RAV4, with Ms. Halbach's blood spattered inside of it, demonstrates he not only had a direct connection and opportunity to murder Mrs. Halbach, but also to plant the following evidence contained in the vehicle. Ms. Halbach's three electronic devices that were burned and placed in Mr. Avery's burn barrel, with some references. The RAV4 license plate that was removed and hidden in a salvage car. Mr. Avery's blood that was found carefully dripped in the front seat of the RAV4 and applied to the dash with an applicator. The RAV4 key that was found in Mr. Avery's bedroom with his, but not Ms. Halbach's DNA. And Ms. Halbach's DNA that was found on a bullet in Mr. Avery's garage. Additionally, if Bobby is the perpetrator of Ms. Halbach's murder, he had the opportunity to burn her body in the Dassey burn barrel, where some of the larger bones were found with cut marks smelling of flammable liquid. The remaining bones and burned gene rivets in Mr. Avery's burn pit. In regard to the Quidlatch DNA swab, Mr. Avery has previously argued that his DNA was removed by Nurse Frisch at the Aurora Medical Center on November 9th, 2005, upon the request of investigators Fassbender and Wiegert, when he was arrested for unlawful possession of a firearm and his body was illegally swabbed. The investigators admitted in their, oh, let me go ahead and read the uh, footnotes no, there. Uh, this, yeah. Uh, the circuit court record shall be referred to as some weird form of doc. The appellate court record shall be referred to as, without the word doc, Sites of the appendix of this brief shall be referred to as app. So this, I'm guessing that footnote is what is also corresponding in all the other motions that she, the amended motions she filed prior to this. Yeah. Because all that was jacked up. Right. Um, and then the second one. On April 4th, 2006, Deputy Hawkins signed the hoodlatch swab, CCSD property tag 9188, over to Investigator Weger for transport to the crime lab in Wisconsin. In, or excuse me, in Madison. When Investigator Weger arrived at uh, the crime lab, he, you have to scroll down to the bottom of the next page. Yep, yep, I just did. 
Uh, presented Wisconsin Department of Justice evidence transmittal form, labeled blah, blah. Deputy Hawkins' name was typed on the form as a submitting officer, which he was not. Then, Investigator Wiegert hand-printed Deputy Hawkins' name on the form, again, deliberately mis misidentifying Deputy Hawkins as a submitting officer, which was a complete misrepresentation. Clearly, Investigator Wiegert switched the groin and hood latch swab and fabricated the chain of custody documentation so that it would appear that Deputy Hawkins submitted the actual hood latch swab to the crime lab. That's very good. Um, okay, let's go back up to the... That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so the investigators admitted in their report that they utilized a woods light to illuminate any secretions on Stephen's body. Fritch subsequently took two swabs in Stephen's groin area. After that, she continued and was going to take some more swabs when S Special Agent Fassbender and Weger conferred and determined that the search warrant did not call for that type of exam. Mr. Avery has previously argued and presented evidence that one of the two swabs was kept and deceptively submitted to the crime lab by Investigator Weger as the RAV4 hood latch swab, which contained Mr. Avery's DNA. I always thought that was going to be kind of a tough one to pull off uh, without actual evidence that he kept it. Um, but still good to point it out. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Avery's trace expert, Dr. Christopher Polenik, opined after conducting a series of experiments that the alleged hood latch swab never swabbed a hood latch. The state argued at trial that Mr. Avery's DNA was deposited on the hood latch when he opened the hood with sweaty hands to disconnect the battery to prevent the vehicle alarm from being activated. The state's theory is implausible at best. Mr. Avery's fingerprints were not found anywhere on the RAV4, even though the state fingerprint expert found eight latent prints on the vehicle and testified that someone with quote unquote sweaty hands was more likely to leave prints than someone with dry hands. The killer had Ms. Halbach's key, so the chances of triggering the alarm were remote at best, and even if that had occurred, the alarm would have been quickly disabled by using the key. Mr. Avery's new witness, Thomas Sawinski, provides a plausible answer as to why the battery was disconnected when he describes the RAV4 lights being off when he observed Bobby and another individual pushing the vehicle onto the Avery salvage yard. Clearly, the obvious and simple explanation for the battery being disconnected was to disable the vehicle's interior and exterior lights so that Bobby and his unidentified companion could push the vehicle onto the Avery salvage yard and avoid detection. Mr. Avery never deposited his DNA on the RAV4 hood latch. The state never explains why Mr. Avery's DNA is not found in the vehicle but is found on the hood latch or why his blood is not found on the hood latch but is found in the vehicle. Of course, his fingerprints are found nowhere on the exterior or interior of the vehicle. Bobby, by his possession of the RAV4, is directly connected to both Ms. Halbach's murder and to framing Mr. Avery. Bobby's possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle gave him the opportunity to murder her and plant the forensic evidence used to frame Mr. Avery. And then a reference. Um, applicable case law. The court in State v. Griffin states the Denny standard as follows. Our Supreme Court affirmed that the Denny legitimate tendency test is the correct and constitutionally proper test for circuit courts to apply when determining the admissibility of known third-party perpetrator evidence. Denny created a bright line standard requiring the three factors be present for admissibility of evidence that an, alert, that an alleged third-party perpetrator committed the crime. When a defendant seeks to present evidence that a third party committed the crime for which the defendant is being tried, the defendant must show a legitimate tendency that the third party committed the crime. In other words, that the third party had motive, opportunity, and a direct connection to the crime. Under the motive prong, the court must question whether the alleged third per party perpetrator had a plausible reason to commit the crime. The second prong of the Denny test, the opportunity prong, asks, could the alleged third party perpetrator have committed the crime directly or indirectly? In other words, does the evidence create a practical possibility that the third party committed the crime? The third and final prong asks whether there is evidence that the alleged third party perpetrator actually committed the crime directly or indirectly. The legitimate tendency test asks whether the preferred evidence is so remote in time, 
place, or circumstances that a direct connection cannot be made between the third person and the crime. Circuit courts must assess the preferred evidence in conjunction with all the other evidence to determine whether, under the totality of the circumstances, the evidence... Uh, uh, yep, good. Yep, sorry, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> the evidence suggests that a third party perpetrator actually committed the crime. Courts must look for some direct connection between the third party and the perpetration of the crime. Argument. Mr. Avery has pled sufficient facts to meet the prongs of the Denny test. The appellate court found that Mr. Avery's new evidence could establish a quote unquote direct connection between Bobby and the murder of Ms. Halbach, making him a viable Denny suspect. Specifically, the appellate court stated, as discussed below, we are not addressing Avery's most recent filing to this court, which seeks to directly connect Dassey to Halbach's murder. If Avery wishes to raise that claim, he will need to bring a new 97406 motion. That motion would need to survive both Escalada Naranjo scrutiny and be found to have merit in which case the evidence presented might supply the missing quote unquote direct connection. In that event, the Valley CD evidence might become relevant to showing Dassey's motive and might bear on whether Dassey is or should have been a viable Denny suspect. We express no opinion on the merit of any such 97406 motion, and all such issues would be for the circuit court to decide in its first in the first instance. The state's motive argument. The state devotes 36 percent, 14 of 38 pages, of its entire argument to motive, which is the least important of the three prongs of Denny. In this case, because of Mr. Avery's new evidence of the direct connection of Bobby to the actual commission of the murder and planning of evidence to frame Mr. Avery. Another 15% of the state's argument, 6 of 38 pages, is devoted to the opportunity prong. A mere 6.5% is devoted to Mr. Avery's powerful new evidence of Bobby's direct connection to Ms. Halbach's murder and planning forensic evidence to frame Mr. Avery. As stated in the introduction, the state's allocation of its argument on the three Denny prongs to minimize the direct connection and opportunity evidence is a deliberate strategy to distract mislead and obfuscate the fact that an evidentiary hearing must be held because Mr. Avery has overcome the procedural bars and met the specificity requirements to proceed to a hearing uh, on his new evidence and Brady violations. As part of its obfuscation strategy, the state attempts to impose an impossible burden on Mr. Avery, not required by Wisconsin case law, to prove with substantial certainty that Bobby had the motive to murder Ms. Halbach. Because motive is never an element of any crime, the state never needs to prove motive. Relevant evidence of motive is generally admissible, regardless of weight. Blah, blah, blah. The same applies to evidence of a third party's motive. The defendant is not required to prove motive. Evidence of motive that would be admissible against a third party uh, were that the third party, the defendant, is therefore admissible when offered by a defendant in conjunction with evidence of that third party's opportunity and direct connection. Here, Mr. Avery has offered his motive evidence in conjunction with evidence of Bobby's opportunity and direct connection to Ms. Halbach's murder and framing of Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery's motive is, uh, excuse me, Mr. Avery's motive evidence is relevant regardless of the weight assigned to it by this court. The state does not dispute that viewing violent pornography could establish motive for murder. Rather, the state claims that the Dassey pornography of young females being tortured, mutilated, and otherwise abused is simply too, quote-unquote, mundane, too vanilla, too boring to predispose someone to commit a murder. The state opines as an expert, without having a real expert, on violent pornography that these searches for images of abused and deceased young females are simply too dull and generic for concern. What's that uh, uh, footnote show? Yep. Uh, according to Wisconsin statute 948-12, or uh, .12, each image of child pornography can be punished as a separate count of possession of child pornography and can be punished by up to 25 years per charge. Woo. Each image. That's very wow. important. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. The state in an effort to divert attention from the powerful new evidence of opportunity and direct connection of Bobby to the murder of Ms. Halbach and planning of evidence, 
claims that Mr. Avery has failed to prove motive by failing to identify with substantial certainty the individual who performed the thousands of pornogra- pornographic searches on the Dassey computer as if the burden of proof requires Mr. Avery to produce a videotape of Bobby performing these searches. Oh, that's nice. The state is imposing a burden of proof for motive that does not exist in Wisconsin law. The issue is whether the pornographic searches on the Dassey computer are relevant to the motive, regardless of the weight of the motive evidence. The state strategy failed to consider that a new uh, new witness has established opportunity and a direct connection between Bobby and the murder of Ms. Halbach and the framing of Mr. Avery. As the appellate court found, if the new direct connection evidence survives scrutiny, the motive evidence found in the Veli CD, quote unquote, might become relevant to showing Dassey's motive and might bear on whether Dassey is or should have been a viable Danny suspect. That's uh, that's a pretty good argument. The state wants this court to believe that because some of the computer searches could be done by someone else, Mr. Avery's Denny argument fails. What the state conveniently overlooks is that no one else from the Dassey household has been identified as having possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle after her disappearance. Oh, that's a good line. Mm. Mr. Avery's motive evidence might be might be evaluated in light of this his powerful new evidence of direct connection and opportunity for Bobby to be the perpetrator of this crime and the one who framed Mr. Avery. Quote unquote, no bright lines can be drawn as to what constitutes a third party's direct connection to a crime. Rather, circuit courts must assess the preferred evidence in conjunction with all other evidence to determine whether, under the totality of the circumstances, the evidence suggests that a third party perpetrator actually committed the crime. Okay. Additionally, in its response, the state ignores well established Wisconsin case law that the court must assume the facts in the pleading to be true when determining the legal sufficiency of the pleading. At this juncture, the court must assume that Bobby was the primary user of the computer, as his brother Blaine has attested to in his affidavit. And therefore, it is highly likely that Bobby was conducting the searches for pornography. Also, Bobby has been caught in a blatant lie about the location of the computer. He told the police the computer was located in the living room, when the crime scene footage showed the computer was located in his bedroom. Regardless of the dates and times of the searches, Bobby cannot be ruled out by the state as the individual who is conducting any of the searches for pornography, and his motive must be evaluated in light of his possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle, which establishes his direct connection and opportunity to commit the actual murder of Ms. Halbach and plant the forensic evidence to frame Mr. Avery. God, this is so uh, yeah. good. This is like her best one ever. Yeah, she's she's yeah, on it. She's, she's laser she's, focused. She's just making it out. Yeah. Uh, and 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 the fact that she's using direct law and the Kate's and the court's own reasoning to establish that. Yeah. It sounds uh, like she's been listening to foul play. <laughs> she probably has. Let me get a quick drink. Oh yeah. All right. Uh, the appellate court correctly noted that Mr. Avery cannot definitively prove Bobby's schedule by relying on the affidavits of his computer expert, Gary Hunt. Mr. Avery has added additional evidence, including the affidavit of Blaine Dassey and police interviews regarding the family members' schedules. Importantly, the motive evidence has to be reevaluated in light of the new evidence of the direct connection and opportunity of Bobby to have actually committed the murder and planted evidence against Mr. Avery. The appellate court did not consider this new evidence, ruling as follows, quote unquote, this is instead a distinct issue that the circuit court should resolve on a standalone basis through a new 97406 motion. Pornography searches were relevant in the investigation of Ms. Halbach's murder. The state claims in its response that, quote unquote, Avery's contention that law enforcement consider pornography as evidence of motive is false. The hypocrisy of the state's argument is vividly illustrated by the fact that on March 10, 2006, the state filed an amended information against Mr. Avery, adding the charge of sexual assault, among others. This amended charge was a result of Brendan Dassey's confession on March 1, 2006. The only plausible reason that law enforcement sets, uh, spent substantial time 
after the April 21st of 2006 seizure of the DASI computer, collecting and analyzing the pornography on the computer was to corroborate Brendan's confession by establishing a sexual assault motive for Ms. Halbach's murder. Uh, the state's electronic data investigator, Detective, well, let's see, what's that say? Almost a year later on February 2nd, 2000. Oh, I was just reading the, the footnote. Oh, the footnote, yeah. Second, uh, okay, it just it just reaffirms what they just said. Right. Uh, Detective Veli created word search no. as relevant. To, what's that? No, it says the that it's not repeating what it said. Oh, almost it's a year later. They filed it. Yeah, and then they almost, dropped it. Yeah. Almost a year later, on February second, two thousand seven, the state filed on a second amendment information, dropping the charge of sexual assault. Ah, there we go. Okay. Sorry, Sorry, my bad. All right. Um, significantly, Mr. Avery's trailer and his computer were also searched extensively for pornography, and none was found. Detective Velli was asked to generate a report of Mr. Avery's computer. Based on Detective Velli's report, no apparent searches of pornographic and or sexual images were made, and no websites with apparent sexual and or pornographic images were, were accessed. The clear working theory of the investigators was that the murder of Ms. Halbach was motivated by a sexual assault as described in Brendan's confession. Other motives were ruled out, such as robbery or animus against Ms. Halbach, who had no known enemies. In Judge Willis's January 25th, 2010 order denying Mr. Avery post-conviction relief, Judge Willis explained that, quote unquote, while neither the state nor the defense was able to offer any direct evidence of motive for Stephen Avery, or anyone else to have wanted to murder Teresa Halbach, it is not fair to say that either party regarded her murder as a motiveless crime. Clearly, there was a motive for Ms. Halbach's murder. Sexual assault is a frequent motive for the murder of young women. There is clearly an established correlation between compulsively and obsessively viewing pornography and sexual assault. Mr. Avery's expert on sexual homicide, Ann Burgess, opines in her affidavit, relying upon 30 years of empirical research, that, oh, that there is a well-established casual connection be between pornography consumption and violent behaviors. And here's the footnote. Dr. Burgess notes in paragraph 15 of her affidavit that not only did the examination of the DASI computer reveal significant searches for teenage child pornography, but also contains conversations between Bobby and 14 and 15 year old girls, which have explicit sexual content. Uh, in paragraph 51 of Mr. Avery's third motion for post-conviction relief, Mr. Avery supports his argument with Dr. Burgess's opinion. The state in its response completely ignores and or overlooks the expert opinion of Dr. Burgess, who provided expert deposition testimony in a Wisconsin premise liability sexual assault case uh, Grabo uh, versus V Prime Outlets in Kenosha, Wisconsin. The state ignores Dr. Burgess's qualifications and publications. Dr. Burgess has been qualified as an expert in the areas of child pornography, crime classification, offender typology, rape victims, rape trauma, and serial offenders. She has published extensively, including co authoring 24 books. 30 book chapters, and over 164 peer-reviewed articles. She has co-authored the book, Sexual Homicide Against Women, Violence Through a Forensic Lens and a Forensic Science Lab Manual. Co-authored with two FBI agents, John Douglas, who everybody should know, and Robert Ressler. Because the state charged Mr. Avery with sexual assault on March 10, 2006, the DASI computer was seized by law enforcement on April 21st, 2006. Law enforcement made great efforts to extract all the pornography from the DASI computer and even went so far as to have Detective Veli conduct specific word searches related to the murder in an effort to connect pornography to the murder. The quote unquote Veli CD contains the state's quote unquote recovered pornography images relevant and material to the Halbach murder. On the CD, Detective Veli refined 14,099 images on the seven DVDs. Uh, in a conversation, Bobby, uh, here's a part of the um, footnote. Uh, in a conversation, Bobby asks that the girls flash him using a webcam. I think that's supporting how the sexual content of his. Uh, yeah. 
conversations. Huh. Um, and then the other one, the CD containing Detective Veli's report and unique word searches was withheld from Mr. Avery's defense counsel. Very relevant. Yes, it is. All right. So he recovered the image of the seven DVDs and recovered 1,625 violent pornography images that had been deleted. That's also important. The CD contains thousands of images of violent pornography, criteria, word searches, registry, internet history, Windows history, and all MSN messages, all of which revealed a propensity for sexual violence. There were 2,632 word searches performed by Detective Veli of words that he believed were directly related to the crime, including blood, body, bondage, bullet, cement, DNA, fire, gas, gun, handcuff, journal, rav, stab, throat, and tires. Before we move forward, um, you know, to, to me, the, the, the Valley CD is significant in many ways. Um, not only by what you've just read off here between you know, here and the above, talking about all the imagery that was found and many had been deleted, but in the fact that Kratzbus held it and even went so far as calling everything found on Brendan's computer not relevant. Doesn't matter. No big deal. No, no biggie. It's very yeah, significant. I think, yeah, I think I think what's what she's pointing out as being equally as significant is the fact that these are the state's terms. These are the terms the state put in to search for or specified to have searched for. So yep. And I yeah. bet we read in here nothing much of evidentiary value. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure that's coming. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh -huh. but because that's what Kratz did. You know, he he went he went to pretty significant lengths to obfuscate that uh, Belly CD and Belly himself. Remember the stipulation project? They didn't yep. want Belly on the stand. So yep. Yep. they didn't want him yep. on the stand. Yep. Yep. Um All right, uh, Doc. Anyone got uh, something to say before we continue on? I uh, I just wanted to quickly say that um, sorry, Mister Jinx, that um, on the reading with the crew series, uh, we've gone through this very very extensively and in a lot of great detail. And uh, someone made the comment, I wonder whether Kathleen Zona is actually watching foul play, and wouldn't that be wonderful if she actually is? Awesome. Yeah. Jinx. <laughs> I'll wait till the next paragraph is read. Oh, okay. Well, it's black. It's not red. <laughs> <laughs> You're so funny. Well, it's black uh, and white and red all over. There you go. A newspaper. Yeah. All right, Sapper, whenever you're ready. All right. In its response, the state only refers to Detective Veli's word searches for news, body, journal, and cement leaving out the other searches and disingenuously claiming that, quote unquote, the mere fact that someone searched for those terms doesn't show anything similar or related to this crime. The state claims that Mr. Avery gives, quote unquote, no explanation of how any of the terms are relevant to an individual's motive for this murder. However, the state chooses these few cherry picked words and ignores the rest to minimize the importance of the word searches. Taking these terms in the context of Ms. Hallbach's murder and its potential motive, all of these terms are relevant. Two bullets from a gun pierced her skull, uh, if you want to believe that. There was a fire ignited by gas and tires which burned her body. She may have been handcuffed. She bled in her vehicle, so she may have been stabbed. Her DNA was found on a bullet, and she did keep a journal. Timing of searches. In its response, the state concedes that Bobby is at least connected to three of the most violent searches prior to Ms. Hallbach's murder. But the state has inadvertently conceded that Bobby is connected to 25 of the searches after Ms. Hallbach's murder. More importantly, Bobby cannot be eliminated by the state from any of the pornographic searches, especially the ones conducted prior to and very close in time to Ms. Hallbach's murder. The individual performing the searches was becoming obsessively deviant in the weeks before Mrs. Hallbach's murder. 
Uh, footnote seven, the state in its response incorrectly argues that McCrary does not have the credentials to opine as a police procedure expert. However, in him in Jimenez versus city of Chicago, the seventh circuit recognized McCrary as an expert in police procedure, as well as in the cases of Williams versus Brown, Tennessee versus Stevens. The state incorrectly asserts that Wisconsin does not allow experts on police procedure. See state versus Newton. As the court noted in Harris versus city of Chicago, McCrary has the following credentials. McCrary has been professionally involved in violent crime investigations and crime scene analysis for more than 40 years, including 25 years as an FBI agent. While at the FBI, Agent McCrary investigated violent crimes as a field agent for approximately 17 years, after which he was promoted by, uh, excuse me, promoted to supervisory special agent and transferred to the FBI Academy in Quantico. As a super, supervisory special agent, McCrary worked for the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime in the operational wing of the Behavioral Sciences Unit. Agent McCrary's primary responsibility as a supervisory special agent was to provide expertise in investigative techniques and crime scene analysis in violent crime investigations, both to FBI field agents and any law enforcement agency that requested FBI assistance. His other responsibilities included conducting research into violent and sexually violent crimes and providing training to law enforcement agencies nationally and internationally. McCrary has investigated over a thousand homicide cases nationally and internationally, including numerous equivocal death cases. Among the agencies with which McCrary has trained and or worked on violent crime investigations are the New York City Police Department, the New York State Police, Texas Rangers, Boston Police Department, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Massachusetts State Police, and the California Attorney General's Office. McCrary has also worked or provided training for the international agencies, including Scotland Yard, the Cuerpo Nacional de Policia in Spain, the, is this still all a footnote? <laughs> it is. I think it is, okay. Yeah, that's a long footnote. Uh, Policia Judiciária in Portugal, the Hungarian National Police, Budapest Homicide, Budapest, all of that, the French National Police, the Dutch National Police, the Metropolitan Toronto Police, RCMP, and Oslo Police Homicide, among others. Well, this guy, that's some serious credentials, yeah, right this, there. You damn Jesus. right. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, go ahead and take that slap in the face, state. <laughs> this guy's been around, and he's you know he's training all these departments in, in various techniques uh, around the world. This guy's a he's a mover. Yeah, he clearly knows what he's talking about because <laughs> everybody's yeah. going after him for that that expertise. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, the state fails to consider that the motive for this crime started as a sexual assault that turned into a murder. So all the pornographic images are relevant. All the evidence appears to point to Bobby conducting the searches in question on weekdays, but it is necessary to have an evidentiary hearing to de to def to definitely determine if it was him. Based upon the findings of Mr. Gary Hunt, 667 sexual content searches were performed in total. Of those searches, 562 were performed on 10 weekdays between 6 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Um, and then she goes through several dates yeah, um, read all those dates. Yeah, you um, don't have to read all that. Uh, therefore, 64 sexual content searches were performed prior to Ms. Halbach's murder between 6 a.m. to 3.45 p.m. when Bobby was supposedly at home alone. Another 500 searches were performed in this same time frame after the murder when Bobby was supposedly home alone. The state has focused on a subset of 128 searches that Mr. Hunt identified, which comprised a very specific image searches focused on pain, torture, humiliation, and death inflicted upon women. Bobby cannot be definitively excluded from the following 128 most violent searches. A, 22 search terms describing forcing sex toys and objects into vaginas. B, 28 searches for terms describing violent accidents, specifically violent car crashes with images of dead bodies. C, 
C, 13 searches for terms describing drowned, dead, or diseased female bodies, and D, 65 searches for terms describing the infliction of violence on females, including fisting and images of females in pain. Uh, second supplemental affidavit of Mr. McCrary. The state links Bobby to 28 of these searches during the day and argues that only three of those 28 are relevant because they occurred before Ms. Halbach's murder. However, the state totally misses the point that all 677 sexual searches are relevant to a sexual assault motive, which would exist before the crime and be corroborated after the crime by a continuing obsessive pornography consumption. Mr. Avery has provided sufficient evidence concerning the schedules of the occupants of the Dassey residence to justify an evidentiary hearing on the issue of who was conducting the searches. Mr. Avery has provided additional evidence from that provided in his appeal about the schedule of the occupants of the Dassey residence, showing that the pornographic searches primarily occurred on weekdays when Bobby was thought to be in the residence. To make this determination, an evidentiary hearing must be held Stated differently, in the absence of an evidentiary hearing, it's impossible to make this determination. And that's why I thought her, her uh, was the, the strongest piece of that Sawinski part was that they had to have a hearing because it would be impossible to determine it without it. Uh, the schedules of the other Dassey household members seem to eliminate them from the searches cited above. Barb's work schedule was from 6 a.m. until 4.30 p.m. every day, Monday through Thursday, of every week. Brendan and, probably going to say Blaine, Blaine would get picked up by the school bus at Avery Road between 7.08 a.m. and 7.13 a.m. and dropped off at the same place between 3.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. Therefore, it appears that Barb, Blaine, and Brendan, the three other individuals living at the Dassey residence, are excluded from being present much less having access to the Dassey computer at the times many of the pornographic searches occurred. Additionally, Brendan would be eliminated from all but 26 of the 128 of the most violent searches related to Ms. Halbach's murder, 20.3%, 20, by having been arrested on March 1, 2006. It is undisputed that Mr. Avery never accessed the Dassey computer. He did not have the password for the computer, nor did he possess a key to the Dassey residence, which was locked when no one was home. Mr. Avery only entered the residence with the permission of Dassey family members. Mr. Avery worked during the weekdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mr. Avery would be eliminated from all but 15 of the 128 of the most violent searches related to Ms. Hallbach's murder, 11.7%, simply by having been arrested on November 9, 2005. Searches that took place after Ms. Hallbach's murder. The state argues, quote unquote, Avery fails to explain how motive to fulfill a violent, porn-fueled sexual fantasy can be formed or proven by someone not viewing any of this material until months after the murder already occurred. However, conduct of a suspected person after the crime is a legitimate subject for consideration as bearing upon the probability of his guilt. Motive can manifest itself after the crime when the perpetrator is reliving and fantasizing about the crime. Everybody knows that about serial killers. The continued searches for pornography demonstrate that the motive for this murder was a sexual assault. It is highly significant that the searches for deceased, mutilated young women began after, not before, the murder and mutilation of Ms. Halbach. The searches after the murder coincide with the fact that a young woman was murdered and mutilated. The searches before the murder coincide with thousands of images of young women engaging in sexual activity, many unwillingly, and corroborate a sexual assault motive. Wow. The Dassey computer? That's, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. The Dassey computer deletions, a consciousness of guilt inference. The state completely ignores the evidence presented by Mr. Avery of the Dassey computer deletions, which infers consciousness of guilt. Significantly, many of the Dassey computer searches had been deleted, and only some of those were recovered, which leads to the question of who in the Dassey household deleted the searches, and why were those searches deleted before Mr. Avery's trial? To make a complete and thorough record of who made the searches, why those searches were made, and who deleted specific searches, there must be an evidentiary hearing that consists of the testimony from the occupants of the Dassey household who can answer those questions for the court. 
It is not possible for this court to determine without an evidentiary hearing who conducted the searches of the pornography and who attempted to delete the pornography after the murder of Ms. Halbach and before the trial of Mr. Avery. See, to me, that's, a, great, that's a very significant. And it's the reason I bitched and grabbed so much is that, you know, after Fassbender uh, got the Billy CD and he didn't add, they didn't ask any real questions because even if there were some general questions, I, I guess maybe there were, there should have been, it should have been a much stronger, even if they, got everybody met in the Dassey house and said, look, we got a problem here, guys. Or call everybody down to Calumet County or Manitowoc and say, look, we got some problems here with what we found on that computer and we need some questions answered. They didn't do any of that. Nope. They should have opened a new case, for God's sake. Yeah, because any any Dude. crime involving a child. Well, somebody yeah. liable. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, none of that, but it, it's a it's a must. Uh, you you can't just blow it off. Yes. Um, you you yes. must investigate. You yeah. So that um, been talking about yeah, yeah. this whole time with Bobby is is why none of that was ever investigated, which is why I think that they used that that to threaten Bobby with. Um, there's that possibility. Um, yeah. I mean, without uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you know what? This is actually going to have a lot of blowback on uh, Tom Fassbender, right? For someone who's got experience yep. in this field regarding pornographic material uh, and the importance of uh, looking at uh, underage uh, porn and torture porn, uh, Tom Fassbender has got an area of expertise in this particular area. Therefore, he can't use the excuse of naivety. So potentially, this is going to have a blowback uh, on the um, on Fassbender and probably others as well. No, so, no doubt about uh, no doubt about others will be included. I think, Doc. Yeah, rightly uh, no. so. Yeah, rightly Wager, so. Oh, and yeah. Kratz and Fassbender as well. I'm not sure whether Mystic Jinx um, is aware of the article, but there was an issue regarding. Um, a lack of investigation by the Wisconsin um, uh, law enforcement officers on other cases involving uh, pornographic material on computers, a failure to act. Mm -hmm. This clearly is a way to obfuscate material that is potentially very, very damaging to their star witness, Bobby Dassey, and they deep-sixed it. And the question has to be asked, why did they do that? Yeah, and it, well, the the other question I have is, it, it it since it's come to light, it's come to light in 2017 when she first filed her uh, initial PCR. So it has been known by by everybody and their brother that this issue existed mm -hmm. of of ignoring possible you know child sexual assault stuff, but nobody has come out and said anything about it in terms of of law enforcement activity nor has anybody come in to investigate it. It's still, nothing has been done. So I, I don't right. know who would, who would have to come in to do that. I would have to assume some agency of the state would have to start it, um, but uh, up to now, nobody has. Uh, and that still blows my mind. There's a crime sitting right in front of them, and they're still refusing to look at it. Wouldn't that be the that's FBI compulsory. who has to look at, because it's the DCI basically that's ignoring it, which is the top cops of you know, they belong to the Department of Justice for Wisconsin. So wouldn't it be the FBI right. that have to come in and, lo and look at it? Because now they have to look into the top cops. Who looks into the top cops of, of an office in a state? Yeah, right. so that that's that's kind of a gray area. So that's the reason that internal affairs exists. So if uh, I would have to assume that DCI has an IED department, um, and I think it would fall to them first to investigate why this this was not pursued by one of their own you know one of their own agents um now where where it would go from there um it potentially could go to the fbi because child sexual crimes are federal as well as you know state level stuff so crossing state they, lines right cross, crossing yeah. state lines right yep um well but go ahead doc 
I was going to say, Dr. LeBeau was asked why the FBI get involved in investigations like this. And he said, we're often called in to look at corruption in office. I tell you what, here it is right on the doorstep. And what is really clever um, is the way Kathleen Zona has constructed this to say, OK, we've got all these things which are up in the air at the moment. In order to sort them out in terms of relevancy, what's important, what's not important, we need to sort this out in front of a judge, potentially a jury. So her approach is, OK, you highlighted all these areas. Let's get together. Let's discuss it. Let's work out what's important, what's not. A very yep. clever strategy by Kathleen Zona. Yep. We also can't forget, not only, you know, talking about this belly CD and what happened in real time in 2006, April through May, we also had to move forward to uh, the end of 2018 when they retook that computer and re kept it for, kept that hard drive for 150 days or whatever the hell it was. Doc may remember. Oh, yeah. Good point, Jack. Good point. Well, Right. They, so they, it was still important for them to have that hard drive. As far as I know, we didn't, Kathleen has never been given the results of that second forensic search. I yeah, found not, that, not that we're aware of, yeah. No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, any other comments before we continue on? I'd like to, um, so we've got a bunch more people in chat uh, without going through a bunch of names. Uh, I know Ripper came. Uh, thanks for coming. We've had some others that have joined. Uh, looks like there's some conversation. I don't see, just right off the top here, I don't see any new folks that have joined in the live chat. We really, really appreciate you dropping by and listening to this reading of this latest filing. So uh, with that said, we're going to, Sapper, if you're prepared, you can just go ahead and continue whenever you're ready. Uh, it is highly significant in any investigation if there is an attempt to delete or destroy records, uh, State versus Rainier. In this sexual assault case, the appellate court found, quote unquote, the defendant's consciousness of guilt was also evidenced as he told the victim to delete the text messages the two had exchanged. Where the, and then she's going to quote another case, where the appellate court found the fact that, quote unquote, the jury heard evidence from which it could infer that Mercer deleted the files where the forensic examiners would have found the child pornography stored in his hard drive was significant evidence of the defendant's guilt. Mr. Hunt has identified eight times when there were deletions on the Dassey computer. Those deletions are very important because they correlate with Ms. Halbach's visits to the property. Ms. Halbach visited the property on August 22nd, 2005, and there are deletions on the Dassey computer from August 23rd, August 26th. Ms. Halbach visited the property on August 29th, and there are deletions from August 28th through September 11th, 2005. Ms. Halbach visited the property on September 19th, 2005, and there are deletions from September 14th through September 15th. There are also deletions from September 24th through October 24th, 2005. I don't know. You know, to me, that, wow. yeah, that's a um, that's pattern. How are the what? ones on the 14th and 15th relevant to the one on the 19th if they were deleted before the 19th even happened? <laughs> Just curious. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, but these other deletions are, I don't know if they're significant or not, but they are pattern. Well, Stephen may have mentioned on the 14th that she, she was coming. Sorry. <laughs> Stephen uh, may have mentioned she was coming on the 14th. Well, you, you could also say that that the, the September 14th to September 15th comes after August. And since she had already been to the property multiple times in that period, they could still be thinking about her during that time, even when she's not there. There's yeah. that potential, sir. All right, Stafford, whenever you're ready. Uh, what, what are we, we going to say, Jinx, uh, about automated stuff? Couldn't it be an automated uh, PC doctor that, like, freshes up your computer every so weeks, so many weeks? And that's why there's a pattern. Every but if, if, it cleans it. If, if that were run, though, it would delete everything, not just specific. No, uh, you can specific do it. File specific here, specific yeah. file there. Well, we don't even know what the files were that were deleted. They might have been temporary files, for all we know, or catchy. She doesn't. She's not specific on what. 
At least well, not yet. August 23 through 26 is three days. August 28th through September 11th is, you know, 13 days or 14 days or whatever. Yeah, it was so that where you, like, you know. You know where we could probably get that information? An evidentiary hearing. There you go. I was going to say. Uh, I, I will agree yeah. to that. Um, just um, before we get started again, Jack, uh, a few others have joined us in chat. We've got Mark Hoddenot, who's joined us in chat. We've got Ali Softball, who's joined us. We've got Tracy Strunsey. She's joined us. Hi, Tracy. Nice to have you here. We've got Crockett, uh, Carol Cousins, um, and obviously Ripper. He joined in as well. Um, hi to everyone that's just joined us behind the magic. Um, good to see you all here. If I've missed anyone, I'm sorry, but we have like 85 in chat, so I'm just trying to get the um the the, the ones that I've seen. Uh, Lord Boku. So th under your scars, thank you very much to each and every one of you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Jack sixty one. Uh, if I could just make a comment, uh, it's uh, there's been a lot of criticism about the the use of the computer in the uh, uh, Yonder household. The other important thing is that it must be established when and when they didn't have access to the internet, because if you if they were reliant on AOL cards, those cards only last a certain period of time, and then uh, internet access stops. So it's important to establish that if there are so-called quiet periods, did this coincide with the fact that there was no internet access at the residence? And uh, again, I agree that only going in front of a judge, an evidentiary hearing, and things like that be uh, finally nutted out, because Barb kept on saying, hey, I never had internet access. Stephen kept on arguing with her, yes, you did. So it'd be interesting to see if there is a pattern when the boys, likely the boys, got new AOL cards, um, I'm wondering whether a record of like that is kept on the computer, i.e. you have to put in a special code to get additional access. And I wonder whether that information is actually known and stored on the computer. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, even, even if, you know, once you set up the your the AOL the, the free time, I'm pretty sure you had to put a credit card in. I'm almost positive, or a bank card at least, something that could you know sustain it with a re reoccurring charge. I wonder if bank records would, um, you know, kind of feel flesh that out if there was actually was even if they had a you know twenty or thirty bank hour trial would not would not be because they didn't you didn't have to have a credit card back then. You didn't have to have a bank. You got. They would give you 45 days or a thousand hours for free on a disc and you didn't have to have a credit card no credit card required no banking yeah. required yeah, yeah. So no, there just, wouldn't be no record of that there, just, there may be a record if they could get like an archived record of john does home phone to be on aol back then you had dial up so she would have been dialing up a server in the area so there should yeah. be a lot of numbers like that coming up local numbers that are the server numbers for AOL in that area. But, you know, I don't think they show those on the records that we do have for Barb's home phone are long distance only. So I don't see any of those. So it's hard to I, say. I know that way back in the, you know, the, the later nineties, you know, when all that started, yeah, we, you didn't have to have a bank card, but I, I, because we had AOL for a long time. Um, you know, and you know, we use a lot of the free trial disc as well. I, I'm just trying to recall when that started. They required a bank card because it did start at some point. Well, because isn't, of, go ahead, so. isn't it proven that that they're on the internet when these searches are being done? Oh, I, I don't you, know the relevance. Of yeah, you have to be. To a, you, the relevance you had is the quiet time, Susan. When there are like they're presumably deleted, oh. how she says it, because there's nothing happening. There's no files to be found, so they presumably think they're deleted. Uh, it could I see be what you're just saying. that yeah. they weren't on the internet at all to make the searches for them to be there. Uh huh. Well, well deletions uh, will de will definitely be seen in the computer registry. That that's something that's you know that takes a 
forensic. Well, it, it's interesting then because one of these presumably, he says presumably deleted. It, it, it's no, presumably means it's not fact, but assumed to be fact, right? And one of those deletions they're saying happened, happened when the property was in the, the hands of the officers. So who's deleting it then? Yeah. The officers? Do you, do, you really need, do you really need to ask that question, Jinx? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did the officers <laughs> actually go into their computer while it was on the property and delete stuff? That Then that would be my question then. Yeah, that, that's... Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> can't answer that without a... We really... I mean, th this is another where it really highlights where we really need that hearing to flesh that out. That That's correct. And what what is so crucial here... Um, it really depends on what type of deletions were done on that computer. Because back in the day, um, you had everything stored in a cache. So if you often went to your cache, it'll keep a record of absolutely everything that you've gone to and downloaded, including images, right? So to specifically delete those, you would have needed to know how to get access to the cache and how to delete it properly. Problem is, it's still on your hard drive. It gets written over in time, but someone who does forensic analysis of a computer knows exactly what to look for, right? So unless the Dassey family knew about military pre precision to uh, blanket a hard drive, uh, all the evidence of downloading that material would have still been on their PC, cleaning it or not cleaning it. So yeah, you, you had the... There's actually, you know, to add to that, Doc, there's, it's actually uh, in more than one place, especially in the registry. It, it's recorded in more than one place. So the registry, the registry back then on those computers basically kept a log of everything the computer did. Every yep. registry that was uh, accessed to and by, right? So someone who does forensic analysis, for them, it would have been a turkey shoot, piece of cake to do it. Yeah, which again brings up, James. you know, the, the second, I'm sorry, go ahead, Susan. Go ahead, Chuck, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, which to me, it, it reinforces, what was the motive for the DCI to retake that computer hard drive in 2018 and keep it for 150 fucking days? Mm -hmm. I mean, why? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to say, Jack. You've got to remember, they went back in 2017 and took that computer. And then by the time KZ's got it, there's a fire on it with Teresa and Stephen and DNA. So, um, and this is just my opinion, no anybody else's, my opinion, and I've said it from the beginning, it would be stupid of Stephen or Bobby or anybody to put a folder like that on a computer knowing what has happened to Teresa. So in my opinion, the police put them on there to try and incriminate Stephen because you've got to remember, they were saying that this computer was Stephen's, not the Darcy computer. So in my opinion, yes, the police could delete stuff, no bother off that computer, whether it was during a search they were doing, or whether it was when they had the computer in 2017. In my opinion, when it comes to Wisconsin, anything is fucking possible in that state when it comes to the polis. Well, that's why that second search to me is uh, really relevant. What what did they find? What did their, uh, the forensics uh, yield? And we don't have that. Well, not, not, only, not only what did they find, what were they looking for? <laughs> That that's too. what I want to know. What, that, what were they looking for? Yeah. Yeah. So is there another CD that got created? You know, another, you know, Valley Tap CD with, a, uh, you know, final, another analysis? That would be interesting to find out. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Where are we? <clears throat> um, okay. Dr. Burgess wrote in her affidavit, quote unquote, it is not unusual for an organized offender to try to cover up his fantasies by deleting files from a computer. She agreed with Mr. McCrary that it is, quote unquote, I'm going to scroll down a little bit, Jack. Uh, it is highly significant in any investigation. An attempt to delete or destroy records. Dr. Burgess quoted the following. 
Uh, the offender in the Halbach murder would be classified as an organized offender who plans, thinks things through, and tries to and bold tries to cover his tracks by deleting incriminating files, interjecting himself into the investigation as a primary witness for the state, misleading the investigators about the timeline and events surrounding the murder, and would be very likely to attempt evidence and frame another for the murder. The offender would keep his keep secrets. The offender would keep secret his commission of the sadistic murder of Ms. Halbach. Dressler case. The state attempts to distinguish Dressler versus McCautry, a case that Mr. Avery cited for support, arguing first that in Dressler, there was no dispute the materials belonged to Dressler. However, the state ignores that the new evidence presented by Mr. Avery establishes that Bobby has a direct connection to the murder of Ms. Halbach by virtue of having possession of her vehicle, which also allowed him to plant evidence to frame Mr. Avery. <clears throat> in Dressler, the only possible direct connection between the defendant and the crime were some generic yellow trash bags found by the police in the defendant's residence that were similar to the yellow bags used to dispose of the victim's dismembered body miles from the defendant's residence. In Dressler, the state relied heavily on establishing motive because the evidence of direct connection and opportunity were weaker than motive. Mr. Avery is relying heavily on direct connection and opportunity and to a lesser extent on motive, which is the lesser of the three standards when the other two are so strong. In Dressler, motive evidence was established by the defendant's pornography collection. Opportunity was established by the simple fact the victim visited the defendant's neighborhood. Here, Bobby's possession of the victim's vehicle is much more powerful evidence of a direct connection to the murder, to the opportunity to plant all the forensic evidence to frame Mr. Avery. The burden of establishing motive based on the Dassey computer evidence is greatly lessened by establishing Bobby's direct connection to the crime and opportunity to have committed the murder and planted the evidence to frame Mr. Avery. The state argues that Bobby's searches did not reveal things closely mirroring the crime, contending, quote unquote, Avery fails to point to a single image or search for someone who was shot and the body burned, nor anything that would suggest that these widely varying types of pornography had any similarity whatsoever to Ms. Halbach's murder and has included such irrelevant and off-point searches as, such as MySpace, tires, race car accidents, Ford Focus accident, disease girls, and big women naked. The state is wrong. Mr. Avery did, in fact, provide this court with specific searches about, quote unquote, someone who was shot and searches for a, quote unquote, gun to head. There were eight searches prior to Mrs. Halbach's murder on 9-1705 for skeleton and a live skeleton. These searches exactly mirror Ms. Ms. Halbach's fate. In any regard, the state misconstrues the holding in Dressler by arguing that the pornographic images must be a mirror image of the crime or they have no relevance. The court in Dressler held that, quote unquote, the pictures depicting violence were offered to prove Dressler's fascination with death and mutilation, and this trait of Dressler is undeniably probative of a motive, intent, or plan to commit a vicious murder. Likewise, here, most of the Dassey computer pornography consists of images depicting violence, even race car accidents, that show a fascination with death and mutilation, and this trait of the Dassey pornographic consumer is, quote unquote, undeniably probative of a motive, intent, or plan to commit a vicious murder. See violent images from Dassey computer on disk attached. Moreover, each piece of a defendant's proffered evidence need not individually satisfy all three prongs of the Denny test. Some evidence provides the foundation for other evidence. Facts give meaning to other facts and certain pieces of evidence become significant only in the aggregate upon the proffer of other evidence. Additionally, strong evidence implicating the third party on one prong may lessen the need for evidence on the other two prongs. Uh, State versus Hopgood. The strong new evidence of Bobby's direct connection and opportunity to murder Ms. Halbach by virtue of having possession of her vehicle after her disappearance lessens the importance of the motive evidence. Nevertheless, the Valley CD of pornographic images and searches on the Dassey computer, when viewed in light of Bobby's possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle, takes on a whole new meaning and has much more relevancy in terms of establishing the motive prong of the Denny criteria than it would standing alone. 
the state's opportunity argument. According to the trial court, Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel already established that Bobby had the opportunity to commit the murder of Ms. Halbach by his mere presence at the Avery Salad Yard on 1031.05. Now the state wants to place an additional burden on Mr. Avery, relying on Kansas and not Wisconsin law. The state admits that under Wisconsin law, quote unquote, opportunity can be established by simply showing the third party was at the crime scene. However, the state contends that in order to meet the opportunity prong, Mr. Avery has to offer evidence that the alleged third party perpetrator had, quote unquote, the skills, contacts, tool, time, and or other means necessary to have committed the, the crime and staged the scene in the manner the defendant alleges. Quoting the Crider opinion, there is no such requirement in Wisconsin law, which states in much more general terms that it is sufficient to demonstrate, quote unquote, evidence that the third party had the realistic ability to engineer such a scenario. The state concludes that Mr. Avery's submissions do not meet the Kansas standard. Since Mr. Avery's case is pending in Wisconsin, he is focused on his submissions meeting the Wisconsin standard, which he has clearly accomplished. Ooh. Uh, the state is baffled as to, quote unquote, why Bobby would want to frame Avery. The answer is simple. If Mr. Avery was not prosecuted for Ms. Halbach's murder, then Bobby was the next most likely candidate to be prosecuted for her murder. He was present and observing Ms. Halbach during her visit to the Avery property on 103105. And, and how many times have we discussed this since uh, this uh, her last filing? I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm talking about how laser focused she was in her filing. And the state replied. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Bobby lied about being asleep from 6.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Searches were made on the Dassey computer at 7 a.m., 9.33 a.m., 10.09, 108, and 1.51 p.m. prior to Ms. Halbach's arrival at the Avery Salvage Yard. Bobby was the only one home during these searches, according to his trial testimony. Bobby was present and awake when Ms. Halbach called and left a voicemail requesting the exact address for the appointment. He was present when Ms. Halbach arrived. He lied about Ms. Halbach walking towards Mr. Avery's trailer because he saw her leave the property at the same time he left the property. He lied about going hunting and passing Scott Toddick at 3 p.m. going east in his blazer when he was seen at 3.30 p.m. driving an unknown vehicle west by his brother Blaine and a propane driver on the Avery property, which resembled Ms. Halbach's vehicle. Ms. Halbach's RAV4 was seen by witnesses parked at the turnaround about 1.8 miles west from the Avery salad yard in the direction Blaine saw Bobby driving. Bobby had human fingernail scratches on his back that he claimed were from his puppy. Bobby gave false testimony about Mr. Avery's alleged remark about disposing of a body. This remark was completely discredited and contradicted by Michael O. Combined reports re-interviews of Bobby where Bobby never told this to law enforcement. Ms. Halbach's fuel-stained, cut, large bones were found in the Dassey burn barrel, including a scapula, portions of a spinal column, metacarpals, and fragments of long bones. The state argues that, quote-unquote, Avery's defense theory has changed dramatically since the trial. However, the state fails to acknowledge that because the trial court barred introduction of third-party Denny suspect evidence in Mr. Avery's trial, obviously prior to the discovery of violent searches and the Swinsky evidence, Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel did not have the ability to suggest that persons other than law enforcement officers had access to bloody bandages, bloody towels, and blood drips that came from Mr. Avery's pre-existing finger injury. In its response, the state claims that, quote-unquote, Avery offers no reason why Bobby would want to send Avery to prison and gives its own wild hypothesis about the impossibility of Bobby's actions to hide the crime. The state claims, quote unquote, nor has Avery explained why someone who wanted to frame him would go to such lengths to hide the evidence. Surely, if Bobby or anyone else wanted to frame Avery, they wouldn't have gone out of their way to make all the evidence difficult for law enforcement to detect, gather, and connect to Avery. The state claims that by hiding the RAV4 on the Avery property, it led authorities right to Dassey's door. The state's assertion is demonstrably false. Putting the RAV4 on the Avery property with Mr. Avery's blood in it 
led the police directly to Mr. Avery's door. The RAV4 was not carefully hidden because the civilian searcher found it in less than 35 minutes among hundreds of salvaged cars. It makes perfect sense, contrary to the state's argument, to burn the victim's remains and personal property and plant them in Mr. Avery's burn pit to frame him. Mr. Avery was the only one who had a huge civil rights case pending against the Manitowoc County Police, so he became law enforcement's target of choice. The police needed Bobby to testify against Mr. Avery to say Mrs. Halbach went to Mr. Avery's trailer and Bobby needed to testify to exculpate himself and inculpate Mr. Avery. Bobby seized every opportunity to frame Mr. Avery, including becoming the state's star witness. The state is incorrect that the evidence was difficult for law enforcement to detect, gather, and connect to Mr. Avery. The evidence was blatantly easy for law enforcement to detect immediately after it was planted, such as when Ms. Halbach's RAV4 was suddenly found coincidentally at the Avery salvage yard after witnesses observed the vehicle in a different location earlier in the week, or Mr. Avery, Mr. Avery's blood found selectively dripped in the RAV4 and placed on the dash with an applicator. None of Mr. Avery's fingerprints were found in the RAV4, even though Mr. Avery could have crushed the vehicle in minutes, he allegedly left it in plain sight for several days uh, with the incriminating evidence intact. Only Bobby stayed behind when others living on the property went to the family residence in Crivets the weekend after Ms. Halbach's disappearance. Thus, Bobby had an easy opportunity to plant evidence against Mr. Avery. Ms. Halbach's key magically appeared in Mr. Avery's trailer after multiple searches had been made of his trailer without the key being detected. The state's response is completely devoid of any mention of its theory during Mr. Avery's trial. The state's theory of what happened the day of Ms. Halbach's murder left many questions unanswered. The state claimed that Mr. Avery inexplicably placed Ms. Halbach's body in the rear cargo of her RAV4 in his garage, then removed her from the RAV4, laid her on the garage floor, shot her in the left side and back of her head. The state's nonsensical theory was contrived to explain the presence of Ms. Halbach's blood on the rear cargo door and in the rear cargo area of her vehicle. The state did not have an explanation for how Ms. Halbach's bones were found in multiple locations, which undoubtedly explained why Mr. Avery was acquitted of the mutilation charge. The more likely chain of events was that Ms. Halbach had finished photographing Barb Yonda's van and as she was leaving the Avery salvage yard, Bobby followed her, flagged her down, and then attacked her. He placed her body in the back of the RAV4, drove back to the Avery salvage yard, drove into his garage, shot her in the head, dismembered her body, placed her body in one of the Dassey burn barrels, and transported it to the quarry where he burned it, inadvertently spilling bones on the ground. And then he brought the bones back to the Avery salvage yard and tipped them into Mr. Avery's burn pit. The theory that Bobby returned to the Avery salvage yard of Miss Halbach in the cargo area of her vehicle is corroborated by the very fact that the propane driver saw a vehicle similar to Miss Halbach's drive past him exiting the Avery salvage yard, and Blaine saw Bobby driving a greenish bluish colored vehicle on STH 147 in the opposite direction Bobby testified he was driving. Both witnesses making these observations at around 3.30 p.m. on 10.30.105. The RAV4 was dumped about 1.8 miles west of the Avery property, where Kevin Romlow spotted it on November 3rd. The state argues that, quote-unquote, Avery has offered no facts at all that would establish how Bobby Dassey, an 18-year-old high school graduate with no criminal record whatsoever, and who was working third shift at a furniture factory, could have executed the state's list of events that it argues had occurred in the murder of Ms. Halbach. The state has offered no facts to establish how Mr. Avery, a high school dropout whose experience consisted of serving 18 years in prison for a crime he did not commit, suddenly decided to murder Ms. Halbach and forego the millions of dollars he stood to obtain from the state and his civil rights lawsuit. Even if a court is disinclined to believe evidence offered by a movement, the court must hold a hearing before making credibility, excuse me, credibility determinations, stating that if the facts in the motion are assumed to be true, yet seem to be questionable in their believability, the circuit court must hold a hearing. 
Only after an evidentiary hearing is the court charged with determining the issues and making findings of fact and conclusions of law. The state claims that Mr. Avery has the burden of demonstrating the following points, which is contrary to Wisconsin law, but regardless, Mr. Avery responds to each of the state's allegations concerning its claim that Avery had offered no facts at all that would establish how Bobby Dassey, an 18-year-old high school graduate with no criminal record whatsoever, and who was working third shift at a furniture factory as follows. Uh, can somebody take over for a little bit? Uh, absolutely. Um, Susan, do you feel up to reading some today? Sure. You, uh, I'm going to highlight this footnote, but you start wherever you'd like. I'll read that footnote because we've gone past it. Uh, contrary to the state's implication that Bobby being 18 years old makes him less likely to have committed the crime against Ms. Halbach, the Department of Justice has data stating that from 1980 to 2008, quote, approximately a third, three, 34 percent of murder victims and almost half of the offenders were under age 25. For both victims and offenders, the rate for 100,000 peaked in the 18 to 24 year old age group at 17. Uh, victims, one victims per 100,000 and 29.3 offenders per 100,000. See homicide trends in the United States. Uh, state's response, one, quote, managed to steal at some unidentified time prior to October 31, the rifle hanging above Avery's bed with which the victim was shot. And at some other unidentified time before November 5, managed to replace it with Avery never noticing. Mr. Avery's reply. The bullets from Mr. Avery's garage and the surrounding property were the result of target shooting around Mr. Avery's garage over a long period of time. All these bullets would have matched Mr. Avery's rifle. The bullet with Ms. Hobock's DNA on it was planted by the killer. The bullet had a substance similar to red paint, like the red paint on Avery's garage, and never went through the school or any other part of Ms. Hobock's skeleton. The killer had access to Ms. Hobock's DNA and could have easily planted it on the bullet in Avery's garage. State's response, two. Could have abducted and killed the victim and hidden both her body and her car in some unknown area in the minutes between her arrival on the property and Scott Tarek passing Bobby Dassey on the highway around 3 p.m. on October 3105 nor has Avery provided any facts to establish where the killing could have happened apart from a nondescript, quote-unquote, in the RAV4, or where Bobby could have hidden the RAV4 and the victim's remains in this short period of time. Mr. Avery's reply. Mr. Avery would challenge the credibility of Mr. Toddick and his timeline at an evidentiary hearing. Mr. Toddick's testimony directly contradicts the testimony of Blaine, who saw Bobby traveling the opposite direction at 3.40 p.m. <coughs> excuse me. Mr. Toddick, <coughs> excuse me. Mr. Toddick would be impeached on a number of other issues at an evidentiary hearing, including but not limited to his entire timeline or his whereabouts on 10.31.05 and his efforts to sell Bobby's 22 caliber rifle after the murder. State's response. Three. Had the scientific sophistication and knowledge necessary for it to occur to Bobby to collect, transport, and plant Avery's blood from his sink, and, as Avery has completely overlooked, his non-blood touch DNA on the hood latch of victims round four and her keys and how Bobby acquired the skills to do this successfully. Mr. Avery's reply. Bobby could easily have removed blood from Mr. Avery's sink by using a wet sponge or rag and dripping it into the round four, which was in his possession. 
He could have applied the blood smear on the dash with any type of Q-tip-like object from the Avery salvage yard. The touch DNA on the hood latch was planted by the police by substituting the groin swab illegally taken from Mr. Avery for the hood latch swab taken by investigator Hawkins. Even if that theory were discounted, Bobby had access to Mr. Avery's DNA by having access to his trailer. So he could have used Mr. Avery's toothbrush to plant his DNA on the hood latch. Bobby had to touch the hood latch to disconnect the battery, and he undoubtedly wore gloves. So perhaps the idea of planting Mr. Avery's DNA came to him as a result of that activity. Perhaps his three, star, his three searches for DNA on the DASI computer gave him the idea. State's response number four, had a convenient stash of unidentified instruments capable of collecting and transporting liquid blood on hand and what those might have been. Mr. Avery's reply, the only quote unquote instrument necessary to transport the blood would be a sponge or rag. State's response five, planted the keys to the RAV4 in Avery's trailer unnoticed and at some unspecified time between November 3 and November 5, yet also either managed to move the RAV4 off the 40-acre property without the keys or drive it away and return on foot from wherever he supposedly took it and then sneak into Avery's trailer again to hide the keys at some other unidentified time, once again unnoticed. Mr. Avery's reply, Bobby had the vehicle key when he drove the RAV4 to its location at the State Highway 147 turnaround on Monday, 1031, and on Friday, November 4, when he moved it back onto the Avery salvage yard. He planted the key in Mr. Avery's bedroom after removing Ms. Halbach's DNA from it and putting Mr. Avery's DNA on it. Many items in Mr. Avery's trailer could have been the source of his DNA, including Mr. Avery's toothbrush. The key was not discovered until November 8. Bobby was alone on the property after the family left on November 4 and early on November 5 until the police blocked off access to the property when Ms. Halbach's vehicle was discovered around noon. All the family members residing on the Avery property had left and travel to Kribitz to the family residence. State response number six, found and then planted a tiny mangled bullet fragment that Bobby inexplicably knew had the victim's DNA on it underneath items in Avery's garage, or alternatively, how he shot the victim in Avery's garage on October 31, and then at another unidentified time, scrubbed the scene with Avery remaining unaware. This despite Avery indisputably having been working on a Suzuki and other vehicles in and around the garage around this time. Mr. Avery's reply, <clears throat> Bobby had access to Ms. Halbach's blood if he killed her and could simply put the blood on one of the dozens of bullets in and around Mr. Avery's garage. There is no proof that Ms. Halbach was shot in Mr. Avery's garage. There is no other DNA of Ms. Halbach in Mr. Avery's garage. There is no blood spatter in Mr. Avery's garage or on Mr. Avery's rifle. There is no evidence that the crime occurred in Mr. Avery's garage. Number seven, state's response burned the victim's body in some undisclosed location and then moved the remains to Avery's burn pit, again completely undetected, and did it so thoroughly as to include at least a fragment or more of almost every bone below the neck in the entire human skeleton, along with the rivets from her genes, nor has Avery provided any facts showing where and when this occurred. Mr. Avery's reply, Mr. Avery was acquitted of burning Ms. Halbach's body. Ms. Halbach's body was not burned in Mr. Avery's burn pit, but was burned in the Dassey burn barrel, which contained Ms. Halbach's bone fragments, which had cut marks and smelled of a flammable liquid. 
Only 40% of Ms. Halbach's bones were ever discovered, and her bone fragments were found in the quarry, suggesting that she was burned in the Dassey burn barrel in the quarry and transported back to the Avery salvage yard where the bones were dumped in Mr. Avery's burn pit. State response. Eight, convinced his younger brother Brendan to go along with this plan and fabricate a confession implicating himself and Avery or why Brendan would do so. Mr. Avery's reply, it was not Bobby who coached Brendan, it was the police. As Brendan's interrogation video indicates, the police fed him the entire story to frame Mr. Avery. After the state improperly alleges that Mr. Avery must address all its speculative theories, it also claims that Bobby would have needed to take action in roughly half an hour because Mr. Avery's blood would have coagulated. The state, without any expert, to support this assertion, claims that Mr. Avery's blood would have coagulated in half an hour. Even so, it is Mr. Avery's theory that the RAV4 was parked 1.8 miles from the Avery salvage yard at the turnaround by the bridge at State Highway 147. Driving at 30 miles an hour, it would have taken Bobby three minutes and 36 seconds to reach the RAV4 which would leave 26 minutes and 24 seconds to plant Mr. Avery's blood. Additionally, Bobby could not have used, Bobby could have used a water infused sponge to collect the blood from Mr. Avery's sink, which would have slowed the coagulation process without affecting the DNA profile of Mr. Avery. The internet search for blood on the DASI computer could have revealed that the addition of water to blood slows or stops the coagulation process. If the defense theory is that a third party framed the defendant, then the defense might show opportunity by demonstrating the third party's access to the items supposedly used in the frame-up, State B. Wilson. As stated previously, Bobby had access to all the forensic evidence and therefore had the opportunity to frame Mr. Avery. Moreover, the defendant need not establish the guilt of the third party to the level that would be necessary to sustain a conviction to introduce third party perpetrator evidence. To support the introduction of such evidence, there must be a legitimate tendency that the third person could have committed the crime. This court cannot determine the new evidence regarding Bobby being in possession of Ms. Halbach's car and moving it onto the Avery Salvage Yard in the middle of the night without holding an evidentiary hearing to determine the credibility of the new eyewitness, Sawinski. No matter what diversions the state attempts to concoct or uh, specious arguments it raises, this issue cannot be resolved without an evidentiary hearing which necessitates credibility findings by this court. C, the state's direct connection argument. This court, quote, must determine first whether the motion on its face alleges sufficient material facts that if true would entitle the defendant to relief, end quote. The state, rather than accepting Mr. Avery's material facts as true, is attempting to dispute those facts with speculative theories unsupported by the record. By disputing rather than accepting Mr. Avery's facts as true, the state is conceding that Mr. Avery is entitled to an evidentiary hearing to resolve those disputes. As an example, the state concedes the necessity of an evidentiary hearing in its footnote 8 by attempting to claim that Sawinski's submissions, quote unquote, changed drastically. The state is attempting to perform its own credibility analysis of Sawinski, which is totally improper at the pleading stage, where the allegations must be taken as true. In briefly addressing the issue of Bobby's direct connection, the state argues, quote, Sawinski's averments that he purportedly saw Bobby pushing a RAV4 on November 5, several days after Ms. Halbach's murder, 
do not provide a direct connection between Bobby Dassey and perpetration of the murder, end quote. However, the corroborated evidence that Sawinski provided does precisely establish the direct connection between Bobby and Ms. Halbach's murder required by Denny. You know, that right there, this is a sticking point. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just for one a minute or two, if anyone else has a comment, this, you know, if they accept as true what Sawinski said, Bobby or whoever, he named Bobby, uh, that needs to be resolved in a hearing. I don't know any other way you can say, they can just say, oh, well, it doesn't matter if if Bobby was pushing her car. And I'm not saying it was Bobby. I'm just saying that's what they're claiming. Uh, they, they're just doing, uh, they're just saying, uh, well, it doesn't really matter. Doesn't mean he committed a crime. Well, that's, he had access to her vehicle. It's him, you know? I agree. Anyone else? Anybody else got a comment about that? <laughs> That's pretty much the same the same uh, trick that Kratz tried to pull with the key. Well, even if they planted the key, or even if you believe the key is planted, blah, blah, blah. blah. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't three-card Monty. Right, or just you know, try to distance yourself from it as though it doesn't matter when, in fact, it really does matter. I was uh, going to say, Jack 61, I remember Bobby Dassey was directly asked, I believe, by Deedring. He asked him, were you ever near that car, Bobby? Are we going to find your prints on that car, Bobby? And uh, Bobby Dassey said, I was nowhere near the RAV. This is very potentially very damning because we have now a direct observation of Bobby Dassey and another individual uh, pushing the victim's vehicle up Avery Road on the morning of November the 5th. You're not, you're not going to get any more damaging than that, no, what, no matter how much the state dances around it. And that's why it's important to get in front of a judge, have an entry, evidentiary hearing and sort this out. Yeah, I, I totally well, what agree. What does it mean? What does it mean when you're like, "Oh, well, he pushed the car," but then they found absolutely no evidence of Bobby on or around the car? Like they already have like ruled him out in the DNA or fingerprint yeah. well, area well, on of that, this on, case, right? So well, on that, well, on that proviso, why is Brendan Dassey in prison? Well, For and we all know that's completely wrong. Also. So that that says something in itself, right? <laughs> Forensics has ruled him out, but he's in prison. Now, all Bobby Dassey had to do was just use a cleaning solution uh, and just wipe off his prints, uh, make sure that he didn't bleed inside the RAF one. That was it, right? So, or wear what's gloves. Good for one yeah, or wear gloves. So what's good for one person is good for another. And the other, the other important thing, now I'm not stating Bobby did anything nefarious. Bobby Dassey's a hunter, so he knows he knows how to skin and dismember a living mammal, right? All you do is you substitute a human being for a deer. It's going to be exactly the same process. Um, someone like Stephen was not an avid hunter. I didn't get the impression that he did very much uh, hunting at all. Um, so, you know, I'm not, again, please, I'm not saying that Bobby Dassey did everything or did anything nefarious, but it's now stacking up against him. And a judge want a judge is not going to muck around. A judge wants to know, okay, Kathleen, why are you pointing a finger at Bobby? Boom, and she'll say the reason why. Yeah, I mean, I think we can all say unequivocally because if we don't say this, what I'm fixing to say, we're, we're, we're hypocritical. As we sit here today, Bobby's innocent of anything. He's completely innocent. Absolutely. Absolutely. The you know so we but we have to keep in mind that that her goal is to establish hey you know Bobby was nearby Bobby was there when Teresa was there Bobby observed this Bobby observed this and and, and these various things so um, yeah it it doesn't look good uh, in how the state applied its logic really totally to, uh, against um, Stephen and then eventually. You know, five months later, hoodwink Brendan into making a bunch of really terrible statements with absolutely, as Doc said, absolutely no forensic evidence. So, 
Also, keep in mind. And really, if getting, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, keep in mind. I thought you were done, Dad. Keep in mind that um, on the spare tire cover, there were fingerprints smudges found. You can see them in the photos that, that was, we show these a bunch of times. In the crime lab, you can see where that thing was handled. They didn't get looked any good prints off of it, but they were there. Go ahead, Susan. I was just going to say, and if Buting and Strang had had the Bailey CD and the Sawinski <clears throat> evidence or the phone call, um, there could have been a very different outcome at trial. Absolutely. 100% agree with that. Yeah. Dapper, do you have a comment? Could have been uh, or I'm it. sorry, Al Alice? I mean, we've also got to remember... She's got to point out at Danny. She's got to make them see that it was somebody else and not Stephen. And that's what she's trying to do. But you, you've also got to remember the other people that we have had our suspicions about, i.e. Ryan Halligas and all the rest of them, they can't be brought up now because they're procedurally barred because of the other motions and everything like that when she's brought them up. So she, she's she got to point the finger at somebody. She's now had somebody come forward and I say that they saw Bobby with the RAV, pushing the RAV and everything like that. So that's the direction that she's got to go in. You know what I mean? I, I guarantee you that if she could still point the finger at Ryan or... Or, or Michael, or whoever, she would do that because it's it's her job to make them see that it was somebody else other than Stephen because she knows that Stephen's innocent, like we all do. You know what I mean? So I can understand why she's doing the Bobby route and getting these explanations. But as we've said, Bobby, to this day, is innocent. It's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. It no must guilty be. until proven innocent. That's but right. that's exactly what happened with Stephen when it came to the law enforcement. They had him guilty before anything was even discovered in this case, before Teresa was even discovered in this case. Remember, is uh, Stephen, Stephen Avery in custody yet? You know what I mean? So... She's, she's got to do something. And I'm sure if she could point the finger at somebody else other than Bobby, she would. But right now, this is her only avenue for her to point at to get her Denny. And as I said, I'm not saying Bobby done anything because I think the whole family was railroaded, pressured, lighty, probably even... Um, threatened, because I wouldn't have put it past Uyghur and all, all the rest of them, to have threatened Bobby where it's either you or your ma, it's you or it's Stephen, you know what I mean? So I'm not saying that Bobby's done it, but I do understand why she has gone down this route with Bobby and pointing all these things out at Bobby, because she's got to do it for some, with, with somebody now, and she's got somebody who's came forward and identified him, you know? So well, I think not, that's why she's doing what she's doing. Yeah, and, you know, even further, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, Sawinski's prior fiancé or girlfriend, whatever, has also given a sworn affidavit that, yes, he did do this. He did call. He made mention of this to me back in real time. So that also has to be considered as a truthful statement until proven otherwise. So. Well, and, and, and also keep this in mind. Uh, Zellner's bread and butter is in the courtroom. That yep. that's where she excels. You you can have a a brilliant lawyer who's who might be terrible on paper, but you put them in a courtroom and they're you know phenomenal. That's KZ. Although KZ is pretty good on paper too. But so even though everything she's doing right now is seems to be singularly focused on one person. You have you just don't know what door you will be able to open when you put somebody on the stand. Look what she did to Remicker about the whole uh, call, the CD calls. 
right? Remaker slipped up, and yeah. that's how we got the that's how we got the Colburn call. So that's right. You never know. You get, you get somebody on the stand to say something they weren't supposed to say, and now you've just opened a door. So who knows? Or they, yeah, right. Or they would have never said otherwise. They're not going to volunteer it. But if you ask them about it, they're not going to lie. With someone like what Remaker did, that's exactly right. You never know what door's going to get opened in an evidence yep. hearing. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what T1 says. T1 says, I still believe Casey's goal is to get into a courtroom to argue 100% the evidence will lead to what the real truth is. Yeah, she, I, I completely agree, T1. She's she's having to point the finger at Bobby and she's having to go through all this so that she can get her chance in court. And then she can get the rest of them on the stand, weak art, fast vendor, the lot of them, and say, why did why was this avenue no took? Why was that avenue no took? And hopefully she will get them to trip up on themselves. Or reveal yeah, something and, that we don't have. Go ahead, Saffir, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I was I was just gonna say, even and and think about this. Let let's assume Bobby didn't do any of this, but she is able to get Bobby on the stand, she's able to get Scott on the stand and completely tear apart their little stories. If she shows enough of a of a propensity for their lies, the court she she could make the court see, well, if you lied about all of that, who's to say you weren't lying about all of this over here? And that also opens a door for getting the new trial. So she she could uh, she she could use that kind of tactic as well. Just just make them look so show their lack of credibility so badly that the court has no choice but to you know go go a different route. Right. Open it up to a, a more full investigation and maybe even order a new trial. Yep. And if that happens, uh, yeah. that, that would that would bring everything back in. Everything. Yep. Procedural bar is out the door. Out no the more. door. No more. That's right. And everything comes not back only in. Does it bring everything in. Not only does it bring everything in, it gives her access to everything. Including the RAV. The RAV. <laughs> Which we all <laughs> I think. Well, yeah, I mean, the bones are gone. Um, so much of the other stuff is gone. However, the RAV. Hopefully, still exists. I think you know we've all doubted it. I pray that we're, I pray that I'm uh, or that all of us are wrong that it does still exist in some undisclosed location in a storage facility that's been controlled. But yeah, anyway. All right. Any other comments? So we can get this finished. Good. We just have a little over nine pages left. All righty. You continue on whenever you're ready, Susan. Okay, the state contends that, quote unquote, at the most generous, the exhibits Avery has submitted could establish that Bobby was involved in the moving of the RAV4 to the location where it was eventually found. The state speculates that the reason for Bobby, Bobby moving the RAV4 was to cover up the crime committed by Mr. Avery. The state's theory is totally nonsensical because Bobby was the primary witness who testified against Mr. Avery. He was not trying to help Mr. Avery. He was trying to frame him. The discovery of the RAV4 in the Avery salvage yard led to all the forensic evidence used to convict Mr. Avery. If Bobby was an accomplice, he was the worst accomplice ever in a murder case. He made a much better star witness for the prosecution, helping to convict Mr. Avery while saving himself. In State v. Williams, the appellate court found a direct connection between the perpetrator of the murder and the fact that he had position, possession of the victim's vehicle several days after her murder. Specifically, the court explained, we agree with the state that from all of these circumstances, under a common sense, non-technical approach, a reasonable police officer would draw the reasonable inference that both Williams and Armstead had been in possession of Brown's stolen car. There was probable cause to believe that both Williams and Armstead probably had committed a crime involving the murder victim's stolen car. State B. Williams, Applying this rationale, 
The Sawinski evidence provides the direct connection, that is, Bobby being witnessed in possession of Ms. Halbach's vehicle, to Bobby probably having committed the murder of Ms. Halbach and planting the evidence to frame Mr. Avery. The state claims, quote unquote, it provides no link at all between Bobby and the perpetration of the actual killing. It also does nothing to establish that Avery was not the killer, even if believed. All Sawinski's evidence would show is that perhaps Bobby was involved in trying to cover up Avery's crime. Citing State B. Bembenek. In Bembenek, the defendant argued that affidavits attempting to implicate her ex-husband as the killer were newly discovered evidence. However, the appellate court found that the affidavits were not newly discovered evidence, but were merely cumulative of evidence introduced in trial. For example, there was already evidence introduced at trial that the victim was afraid of the third party. None of the affidavits established that a third party was directly connected to the crime. Ben Benick is completely inapposite to the Sawinski evidence in Mr. Avery's case. The new evidence presented by Mr. Avery is not cumulative of evidence presented at Mr. Avery's trial. None of the evidence provided by Sawinski directly connecting Bobby to the actual murder of Ms. Halbach had the opportunity to plant the forensic evidence to frame Mr. Avery was known during any prior proceedings in the case. Sawinski's evidence is quote unquote newly discovered. For example, unavailable and not discoverable through reasonable diligence at the time of Mr. Avery's June 2017 motion. Sawinski's existence and information was not known or discoverable by current counsel until Sawinski contacted counsel on 4-11-2021. Additionally, the state overlooks the fact that the possession of evidence used to frame the defendant also qualifies as making someone a third party Denny suspect, State v. Wilson. The state is attempting to impose a burden previously rejected by the Wisconsin Supreme Court in the Denny decision. The state is requiring that evidence connecting a third party to the crime to be quote unquote substantial. Wisconsin rejected that standard in State v. Wilson, holding that standard to be unfair to defendants. State waived the Escalon and Naranjo procedural bar. The appellate court specifically directed Mr. Avery to file this motion pertaining to the new evidence from Sawinski and specifically stated that that evidence needed to survive any state v. Escalon and Naranjo uh, 1994 challenge, but perplexing, perplexingly, the state has waived the Escalana challenge by not raising it. Therefore, the state has conceded that Escalona is not a bar to Mr. Avery's new motion. Mr. Avery has provided a quote-unquote sufficient reason for overcoming the Escalona bar in his third motion for post-conviction relief. Number two, Mr. Avery is entitled to an evidentiary hearing on his newly discovered evidence claim. A. Defendants must meet a five-part test to obtain a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. When moving for a new trial based on an allegation of newly discovered evidence, a defendant must prove, number one, <clears throat> the evidence was discovered after conviction. Two, the defendant was not negligent in seeking the evidence. And three, the evidence is material to an issue in the case. And four, the evidence is not merely cumulative. State v. McCallum. If the defendant is able to prove all four of these criteria, then it must be determined whether a reasonable probability exists that had the jury heard the newly discovered evidence, it would have had a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt. State v. Love. B. Avery has pled facts that would sufficiently establish the three prongs of Denny and Mr. Avery's allegations that Bobby was the perpetrator would be admissible in trial. 
As stated above, Mr. Avery has sufficiently established opportunity, motive, and a direct connection of Bobby to the crime. C. There is a reasonable probability of a different result at a new trial. The state argues that even if Mr. Avery has presented newly discovered evidence, at least satisfying the first four prongs of the newly discovered evidence test, he cannot show that this evidence would cause a jury to have a reasonable doubt of his guilt. First, the state contends that because Mr. Avery did not plead sufficient facts to establish any, his allegations would be inadmissible at trial, and thus, he's not entitled to an evidentiary hearing on his newly discovered evidence. However, as already argued above, Mr. Avery has pled sufficient facts to establish Danny. Therefore, the state argument fails. Second, it real, real argues quick. that... Mm -hmm. is, is Tracy still in chat? I think she went to go eat I dinner. I think she went to have dinner and she's yeah. she's going to come back, I think. Yeah, oh, I shoot. I invited her. I invited her to come to Discord to have a chat. I don't know if she will or not if she has time, but that'd be great. Uh, Sapper, that's page uh, thirty-six and seven. If you want to make a note of it. Okay. Um, yeah, because it, it just occurred to me. Bottom of thirty-six. She, she mentions 30. the fact that the state 30. did not make any claim to Escalano Naranjo in any of their responses. So I'm curious. If that is exactly true, if they don't claim it, they cannot claim it now. That is interesting. I, I caught that as well. Didn't she just? Didn't she just say just the uh, Escalona part that they didn't? Right. Yeah. That that they didn't. They didn't make a a claim or a challenge on Escalona Naranjo. So by proxy, they have waived it. Right. That, that's a, that's that's big. That's huge. Yeah. If that's true, if that's true, if they didn't challenge it and cite it as a you know whatever in their pleadings, uh, damn. I don't know. That is a yeah. that is a great that yeah that is a lawyer question. Um, Charisse, exactly. Page the bottom of page thirty five that start. So Cherie's not Cherie's not home. Cherie's not here yet, so she's probably. Um, well, I don't know where Sheree is at. She's probably busy with something, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Continue on. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. We're, we're almost there. Second, it argues that even if the Sawinski evidence were admitted and Mr. Avery's theory of defense were presented, there is no reasonable probability of a different result at a new trial. The state claims as explained above, there are far too many irreconcilable inconsistencies between Avery's allegations about Bobby Dassey and the actual evidence produced at trial. Particularly damning would be Avery's complete failure to account for his DNA on the hood latch of the RAV4 and Ms. Hallbuck's remains, again, including a fragment from virtually every bone in the human body being found in his burn pit, and nothing to explain how Bobby could possibly be responsible for the bullet with Miss Halbach's DNA on it being found in his garage and matched to the gun above his bed. Mr. Avery has addressed his DNA on the hood latch. In regard to Miss Halbach's bone fragments in his burn pit, the state needs to be reminded that Mr. Avery was acquitted of burning Ms. Halbach's bones in his burn pit. Additionally, as noted above, Mr. Avery's current forensic fire expert, John DeHaan, has completely refuted the state's theory that a human body was ever burned in Mr. Avery's burn pit. Mr. Avery has explained how Bobby could easily be responsible for the bullet with Ms. Halbach's DNA being planted in Mr. Avery's garage that matched his gun Ms. Hobbock's DNA in the Rob 4 and the spent bullets from Mr. Avery's rifle in his garage and property were easily accessible to Bobby. The state claims that the quote-unquote enormous amount of forensic evidence pointing directly to Avery as the killer were all far more material than Bobby. 
the state misses the mark entirely. If Bobby transforms into a viable third-party Denny suspect because the Sawinski evidence is found to be credible after an evidentiary hearing, all of the forensic evidence used to convict Mr. Avery is now placed in Bobby's hands. He is no longer facing a jury as a disinterested, unimpeached witness. The state has not presented a shred of evidence that Bobby did not commit this crime, such as an alibi, particularly in light of his possession of Ms. Halbach's blood-spattered vehicle directly connecting him to her actual murder. His opportunity to plant all of the forensic evidence and the motive established by the pornographic searches on the DASI computer located in his bedroom. In State v. Wilson, the court held that, quote unquote, it is unconstitutional to refuse to allow a defendant to present a defense simply because the evidence against him is overwhelming. Mr. Avery would be able to present his theory that all of the evidence against him was planted and that Bobby is a viable third-party suspect. There is a reasonable probability of a dis different result at a new trial. Number three, Mr. Avery has pled sufficient facts to establish a violation of Brady v. Maryland. A, Mr. Brady, Mr. Avery provided sufficient facts to establish the audio clips materiality. In addressing a Brady claim, the court is not to view each piece of suppressed evidence in isolation. Instead, the court is required to assess the cumulative impact of all the suppressed evidence to determine its materiality. Kyles v. Whiteley. Suppressed evidence is material if its cumulative effect creates a reasonable probability of a different result at trial. A reasonable probability of a different result exists if the suppressed information undermines confidence in the verdict. A reasonable probability is lower than a preponderance of evidence standard. It is demonstrated where the defense shows the failure undermined confidence in the conviction. Youngblood v. West Virginia. The state claims Avery's dogged insistence that Bobby Dassey was the state's primary witness against Mr. Avery at his trial remains false no matter how many times he repeats it. Bobby established only that Ms. Halbach arrived at the Avery salvage yard on the day in question and that he saw Ms. Halbach walking toward Avery's trailer shortly before she disappeared. Bobby was the state's primary witness against Mr. Avery. During his closing argument, Prosecutor Crash once again emphasized the importance of Bobby's testimony and vouched for his credibility. We talked more about the timeline and we heard from Bobby Dassey again in the same kind of a position to be. His credibility to be weighed by you, but is an eyewitness. Again, an eyewitness without any bias. It is uh, an individual that deserves to be given a lot of credit because sometime between 2.30 and 2.45, he sees Teresa Halbach. He sees her taking photographs. He sees her finishing the photo shoot. And he sees her walking up toward Uncle Steve's trailer. Bobby's testimony was the most determinative of Mr. Avery's guilt. Let's see, for 09, Bobby was one of only two witnesses whose testimony the jury requested to review during deliberations. Bobby's testimony was the most determinative of Mr. Avery's guilt because the state used it to establish that Ms. Halbach never left the Avery property alive. If the jury knew that Bobby was lying about seeing Ms. Halbach leave the Avery property because he was in possession of her blood spattered vehicle, and moved it back onto the Avery property, then the defense could have argued that Bobby was directly connected to the actual murder of Ms. Halbach and planted the forensic evidence to frame Mr. Avery. With a viable third party, Denny suspect, who was directly connected to Ms. Halbach's murder and to the planting 
the forensic evidence to convict Mr. Avery, Avery confidence in the verdict would be undermined. There is more than sufficient evidence to conclude that Bobby actually committed this crime. There is no reason for him to have told the multiple lies that he has told in this case if he has no culpability. There is no reason for him to have possession of the victim's blood spatter vehicle or to have planted it on the Avery property. There is no reason for him to have unexplained scratches on his back or the victim's cut, fuel-stained bones in the Dassey burn barrel. Bobby was the only family member to stay on the property after the others had left. B. Mr. Avery's Brady claim regarding Kevin Romlow has not been litigated. The state incorrectly claims that the Brady issue regarding Romlow seeing the Rot 4 was already litigated. In the appellate court's July 2021 opinion, the appellate co court noted that in Mr. Avery's motion for reconsideration, he raised an issue pertaining to a witness affidavit attesting in 2005 a witness, Romlo, observed a vehicle matching a missing person poster of Hobbock's car and informed law enforcement that, of that fact and, quote, the state withheld evidence that Hobbock's vehicle was seen on the street days after her disappearance, end quote. The appellate court declined ruling on the issue and therefore it was never litigated. Specifically, the court stated the following. Neither we nor the circuit court have squarely considered whether these claims are procedurally barred under Escalona Naranjo or whether Avery pled sufficient material facts entitling him to a hearing, although our analysis overlaps with the former inquiry. Such consideration would have to come on a separately filed 97406 motion, and we express no opinion as to whether such claims would be barred in the event such motion is filed. Mr. Avery could not have discovered the existence of Romlo through reasonable diligence because there was no mention of him in any police report or prior defense counsel's file. It would have been impossible for Mr. Avery to discover this evidence. It's only after Mr. Avery filed his 2017 motion that this witness came forward. Discuss? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, just briefly, um, that's right. I mean, there, you know, we get into this uh, uh, hide-and-seek uh, present presentation of evidence because, again, we talked a little bit about this last night. Uh, there was so much that we've seen uh, from a, from our advantage that the jury never saw or heard. They had no idea. I mean, that, you know, there probably were some, some elements, but so much of this stuff— like this call, I mean, actually, I'm going to play the, the Swinsky call. I mean, it's only a minute, but here in a few minutes. Um, th this thing is, was buried for, for intents and purposes from, two, you know, November, I think it's November 6, 2005, up until uh, earlier, um, early last year, whatever it was. February, March, I, I can't remember exactly now, but basically a year ago. That call, we, no one ever heard that call. So that's the Sowinski call, which is so much at the heart of this right here. And there are other pieces of the Ramlo stuff. There was no report. How much other stuff that they have is unreported? The, the blunt, blunt and bloody uh, instrument in the back of the RAV in that search warrant affidavit, buried. Had no idea. Didn't fear in any report. Uh, can I just say that uh, Ramlo, Ramlo's observation is incredibly damning and very, very powerful because the argument can be made, why on earth would you put out missing person posters with description of a vehicle if law enforcement are not going to act upon a tip and an observation by a member of the public? It's counterproductive, counterintuitive and is extremely damning because no report was put forward. So therefore, um, Ramlo is not the only person who noticed the RAV4 off the property. So I want to see how the state are going to explain 
why all the effort went out to ask members of the public to be on the lookout for Teresa Horbach's vehicle and then ignore reports of people seeing it. I would love to hear uh, an explanation from the state and from law enforcement. So to me, Ramlow's observation is incredibly damaging. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, any other comments? We just got just a little bit more to finish this. Uh, finish this up. Any more comments? All right, Susan. Yeah, you, know, you can um, finish. Around. I think there's three pages left. I'm going to turn them over, Jack. Okay. All right. Um, Rhonda, can you finish up these uh, last few pages? Sorry, yes, I can. No problem. Okay. Um, let me move my laptop. Okay. C, the record does not conclusively demonstrate that Avery could not establish a Brady violation at a hearing. The state claims, quote, even if Mr. Avery's Brady claim regarding Romlo were not previously litigated, it would fail because the record conclusively demonstrates that what Romlo says in his affidavit about telling Sergeant Andrew Colburn on November 4 that he saw the victim's RAV4 on a highway cannot possibly be true, end quote. The state proceeds to dispute Colburn's schedule, which is improper which is an improper, improper attempt to litigate witnesses' credibility in the pleadings. Ramlow's credibility must be the subject of an evidentiary hearing. R regarding the Sawinski evidence, the state deliberately conflates the snippet of audio that Mr. Avery discovered with the information that Mr. Sawinski provided to police that is the basis of his Brady claim. Mr. Avery does not have to present any audio, including a snippet of audio, to allege his Brady violation. In fact, the significance of the audio is that it corroborates the fact that Sawinski provided exculpatory information to the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department that was suppressed by the state. Sawinski could simply testify he reported the occurrence to law enforcement and if this court finds him credible it is sufficient to establish a brady violation the state's claim that the audio clip transcript undermines the veracity of mr avery's claim is nonsensical because the court can listen to the audio clip without looking at the translation provided by mr avery the audio clip from the manitowoc sheriff's office speaks for itself Further, in regard to footnote 10 of the state's response, Mr. Avery is not obligated to have an affidavit from Sergeant Senglub or any investigator at the Manitowoc Sheriff's Office who spoke to Sawinski on the phone. It is sufficient that Sawinski would testify that he made the call to Manitowoc Sheriff's Office and it is up to this court to determine his credibility. The audio clip simply provides some corroboration of Sawinski's witness affidavit. Four, Mr. Avery has satisfied the Allen requirements for an evidentiary hearing. The court in Allen determined that a motion contains sufficient material facts for an evidentiary hearing if it includes quote, the name of the witness who the reason the witness is important, why and how, and facts that can be proven, what, where, when, that clearly satisfy the Brentley standard and would entitle a defendant to a hearing, end quote. As the chart illustrates, Mr. Avery has met all the Allen requirements. This is a really good chart. So do you want me to read across those as well? Yeah, you can do the, I'll just, I'll just say the ones at the top and you can read the, 
what she's got written. Okay. So, so who? Thomas Sawinski, witness who observed Bobby Dassey pushing Miss Hallbach's vehicle. What? Sawinski was delivering papers on the Avery salvage yard in the early morning hours of Saturday, November 5th, 2005. He observed Bobby Dassey with an unidentified male with pushing Miss Hallbach's vehicle down Avery Road on the right side towards the salvage yard. Where? The Avery salvage yard. When? The early morning hours of November 5th, 2005, the same day Ms. Hallbach's vehicle was discovered by law enforcement after civilian searchers discovered the vehicle on the Avery salvage yard. Why and how? This new evidence disclosed to Mr. Avery directly connects Bobby Dassey to the actual murder of Ms. Hallbach as well as having the opportunity to murder Ms. Halbach and plant the forensic evidence used to convict Mr. Avery. This new evidence combined with the previous, this new evidence combined with the previous motive evidence establishes Bobby as a third party Denny suspect. As with any other civil pleading, in assessing the legal sufficiency of the motion, the court must assume the facts alleged therein to be true. Gritzner v. Michael. Even if a court is dis disinclined to believe evidence offered by mo Movent, the court must hold a hearing before making credibility determinations, State v. Allen. Only after an evidentiary hearing is the court charged with de determining the issues and making findings of fact and conclusion of law with stat Wisconsin Statute 974063D. Conclusion. Mr. Avery respectfully requests that this court grant him one of the following alternative remedies. One, grant an evidentiary hearing. Two, grant his amended motion for post-conviction relief by ordering a new trial, and three, grant the re requested relief and grant any and all relief this court deems appropriate. Dated this 26th day of January, 2023. Well, I think that deserves a round of applause. Yeah, it's, it's really well-written, um, not overall. Yeah, she she was really. She's got the knife really sharpened, um, despite you know the the hurtful implication towards Bobby. Obviously, this is you know, very you know hard for the family to to hear and read through. Um, but this is all that she has, and but it's and it's, I say it's all she has. I'm talking about all of the everything she's included. And it's not just about Bobby. It's about Sawinski and what comes along with that. It's about Ramlo and what comes along with that. The Brady violations. I mean, there's a there's a pretty pretty good mess of stuff, uh, things that she's included in this. It's not just about Bobby. It's just an excellent argument. It is. In my opinion. Yep. You know, I, I, I kind of those, look at it this way. All of those levels. I kind of look at it this way. It, it, it may be painful, but Brendan and Stephen are sitting in prison because their families, in one way or another, helped put them there. They served <laughs> them up on a platter with a lot of their lies and, and their misrepresentations. So mm -hmm. I, I personally don't have any any empathy for the other members of the family, because like I said, they helped put them there either directly or indirectly. And you're exactly right. And like you said, Bobby is innocent right now. So. Bobby is, Bobby is innocent right now. Um, as we sit here today and, you know, we, keeping that in mind that, you know, I've tried to gear my brain in that direction, not just have these, you know, knives out for Bobby, because 
you know, as we've talked about many times, there could have been reasons why he did what he did. I mean, it you know, even if, it, you know, not considering the fact, any kind of thing that's in his mind, he was going to, something went sideways, he decides to commit this crime and then pin it on his uncle. There, there could be, if, if it's true, there could be a lot of other mitigating stand, uh, circumstances. If it's not true, um, and the state compromised him in some way, you know, we, we see the prosecutor in this case, he, is, he made all these fantastical, all about him crap over the years, and then boom, you know, a few years ago, he releases this video uh, showing that Stephen was under surveillance within the jail in real time. And boom, he's gone. He disappeared. Cheated. Yeah, cheated. Absolutely cheated. Yep. Well, There's to, a, to, kind of, to, to kind of go along with, with some of that, you know, the uh, Barb, uh, Bobby, a lot of them like to, their, their continuing story is, well, we were pressured by law enforcement. Okay, fine. Bobby, get on the stand. Tell me exactly what officer threatened you how they said it, what they said, and when they said it, and then do the same thing with Barb. If you're going to claim pressure, uh -huh. you better drop some names and some specifics on what those threats were. Yep, that's right. Step forward, step forward in a lot. These changing sadly, statements. Sadly, it's not going to go it. well for Bobby if they say if he says, "Oh, it was Deirdre," because then he willingly speaks to Deirdre in 2017, yeah. and that doesn't look good for him. No. Right. Well, and Taddock's ever Still changing statement, track? you know, Taddock's mm -hmm. changing statements from November 10th, November 29th, 2005, both of those to 2006 uh, to the Calumet County Sheriff's Department. And then at trial, four statements and testimony that very wildly, uh, it's terrible. So was there a compromise situation going on? That's what it looks like from the outside looking in from me. But, uh, you know, that's just an opinion. Mm -hmm. Has, has no weight on anything, but so. Well, just the porn alone. I mean, they could have used that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, they did. Wow. <laughs> now, now, now you, now you're definitely going to have some officers getting investigated. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Now, not only do you know that there was a crime involving anyway, yeah, but you used it, yeah, to blackmail what was it? your star witness. What was it? it was 25 years for each image, yep, you know, and there was over what 14,000 images and a thousand and odd deleted, so. I mean, it's. I'll I'll take my hat off to Casey. She's. She's done. I think she's done a better job in this one than she's done in the last few that she's posted. Um. I agree. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, Susan. So clear, um, clear yeah. and convincing. That's what I call it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Even, even if I'm even if I'm not completely sold on Sawinski and his story, what she's done is laid laid out the foundation for why it is impossible to do anything, make any kind of judgment without a hearing. That's right. Exactly. That needs to be argued in the court. Present your side, question the witnesses, get them under sworn testimony. And make a decision. I mean, you know, she didn't even bring up the fact of, you know, there's another flyover tape video, whatever, that we've never really seen anything of. It's another, it's kind of like the blunt and bloody instrument. It's actually not even mentioned anywhere other than the email filing sent to Uyghur and all, of, all those that he copied about this second videotape that they couldn't get to play or there was something wrong with it. That's all we know about it. Boom. And where the hell is that thing at? And what did they find? Were they able to get it to play? 
Well, when she gets a new trial, <laughs> maybe part of it. To me, two things resonated in, throughout reading this um, filing. One is, uh, remember you guys, um, Christine Rudy case, when her husband, Sean Rudy, shot her, dismembered her, burned her, and threw half of her in the river? Yep. Remember that? He was having an affair with some girl, and that girl admitted to everything, and she got nine months. Nine months, and she was present when uh, Christine was shot. She was the accomplice in all of this, right? And for such a vicious murder, she got nine months. To me, this whole VCD, the Bobby and uh, searches, the computer searches, and the severe penalties that could arise if prosecuted is just nothing more than that. It was an under table deal, under the table. You do this, we'll do that. Because I'm gonna say it again. Remember that document, Jack, where Bobby said, and it was in, I think, Castle or DOJ, I don't know. Um, when Bobby said he saw to Stephen going towards his trailer. That was the, Teresa. yeah, that was the, uh, when he was questioned by Lloyd's investigator on November 21st or 23rd, something like that, 2005. That's what he said. He saw Stephen walking Steven, toward his trailer. Not yeah, Teresa. Not Teresa. So look, that just one. Jimmy fact that they switched names, right? What it transpired to be. Sorry, it changes everything. Everything. Absolutely everything. And then what Dr. Silkman said that resonated with me as well. This whole time they're looking for the green rab, 1999, green green rab, Sam whatever, Henry Whiskey. And then what? People are calling, we saw it, we saw it, we saw it, and they have no regard to check it out. No regard. Right. Unbelievable. Don't forget about the geocaching call. The guy called in and said he saw that blood all over those, that tree and the roots. And as far as we know, it wasn't investigated. It, that was out in the middle of freaking nowhere. Yeah. Hey, before, before we get too much further, I'm going to play this Swinsky call. It's about a minute. Because it's a it's another thing that's at the heart of this filing. So uh, anyone that's here in Discord, you're gonna have to unmute YouTube uh, to hear this. So uh, here we go. Uh, I, I I don't know if I this good information bad information. What do I talk to about this um the girl that's missing from Hilbert? I can have you speak with my chef commander. Can you hold on a Thank moment? Thank you. Sure. Hey, I'm going to transfer to the ship commander. You'll be speaking with Sergeant Singh Lab, okay? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, when I hang up, is a man on the phone who thinks he has some maybe more leads and he wanted to speak with somebody on the case. All right, good. All right. But we don't get to hear the you know, the second half of that call, unfortunately. Uh, there, yeah, there's actually been claims out there that uh, that other part of that call is uh, in existence and then it got removed from foul play or, or wherever. Um, and I'm telling you right now, that's not true at all. We have never heard. Sounds Any like a guilter to me. We've never heard. Yeah, we've never. Well, it actually was a, not a guilter that said this, made these claims. But, oh, yeah. It wasn't. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, we've never heard the second part of this because if we had, uh, this 
this could have really this could have really blown up the case, like really blown it up. Wait a minute. But, Some, somebody on the truther side has accused foul play of deleting that. Yep. Second part of the call. <laughs> yep. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, we are for truth, so why would we do that? Exactly. Right. We have to look at all aspects of this case. We can't just delete stuff. What is that about? That's right. That's exactly right. We would never do that. I mean, you know, well, here's stuff. here's a thought. If, it would have been explosive. Well, well, no. Here's here's a thought. If foul play had it, don't you think frickin' KZ would have had it? They're, they're insinuating that, that the second part of the call is going against what Tom Sawinski is saying now. That that is the impression I am getting from that statement. That's what they're insinuating. We yeah. it was deleted because okay. it, it does not help Avery, right? <laughs> and and how many times how many times have we made arguments against Avery? <laughs> Yeah. We, we've 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 routinely had discussions where we brought up stuff that was against Avery and debated it and talked about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, that's right. <laughs> we wherever just the, want the damn truth. Yeah, wherever period. it goes, wherever it goes, it goes. We have no, you know, connection one way or the, uh, another, um, and, and we we're not going to profit from the outcome one way or the other. We want the truth, as Susan just said. That's all we want is everything. All the cards on the table. And let's see who's telling the full truth. Let's see what was withheld. And I know, I know for, I know for damn fact that we still haven't heard the full story. I suspect, again, I said it yesterday. I suspect there's another a CD, DVD that uh, is in the possession of these phone calls from Manitowoc County that we've never got. Well, just the fact that there's zero audio from the fourth kind of says that absolutely yeah i totally agree yeah. yeah but not only that what we've just played corroborates what solinsky is saying you know what i mean he's he said he called them up and made a report that is corroboration that he actually did call them up whether we've heard the other part yet or not you know that is every you're trying to tell me that the the cops never had this during trial that cracks and all that didn't have their hands on this call during trial you i they did but because it didn't fit their narrative because it's going against steven by saying that the car was off the property then the state's not going to put that in. And KZ said in her statement, in her motion, that it was hidden from the Defence Council. So if that's no new evidence and corroborating evidence, then what the hell is? I, I, I have uh, a suggestion I, I... for the guilters who believe that somebody's hiding something. It's very simple. You go to Manitowoc, you can go to the website, and you can request the same record to see if anything was hidden by anybody. Right. If, if, yeah. the call, if, if the call is not there, then they should be asking themselves more why the state felt the need to hide it for 17 years. <laughs> well, I also I also enjoy the fact that KZ pointed out that, hey, I don't have to prove or even provide the fact that there was a second part to the call. Just the mere fact that the first part of the call exists satisfies the Brady requirement. Yeah, it's yeah. that part. Because in, in Zawinski's affidavit, he says that he calls them on the 4th or the 5th to ask to speak to somebody, and then you've got the call that's corroborating that. So, in my opinion, no, she doesn't have to provide the other part of that um, that phone call to prove that what he's saying is true. He told her in 2021 that he called them on the 4th or the 5th, whenever it was. And there, we've all just listened to it as him saying, uh, calling up about it. And if I remember right, uh, Casey's investigators 
also went to his ex-girlfriend, which was his girlfriend at the time, who would know his voice over a phone or anything like that, and got the cooperation that it is actually his voice on that phone message. Yeah, so she, she, sa she signed she, she she an affidavit. Yeah, so it's not only him that's saying that that's his voice on that phone call, there is another corroborating witness to say that it is his voice on that phone call. You know what I mean? So for them to, to deny this to even be investigated for, or further or even a question why it wasn't followed up during the investigation, as Doc said earlier on, this was a missing persons inquiry. They were asking the public for information to look out for Teresa, look out for her car, everything like that. So people did see her car not on the fucking property and reported it and he just brushed it under the fucking carpet. Yep. Yep. I pulled up. You know, uh, this exact situation is actually happening right now in the murder murder case where he was caught on the Snapchat and it was just his voice. He wasn't in the video. Alex Murdoch's uh, voice and family member have corroborated that that's actually his voice. So it does happen, and courts do accept that as the truth, as the fact. Absolutely. I pulled up this document, never really mentioned. Uh, this document that's on the screen right now, this is... It's gold. The document is gold. It, it is, and it's uh, well, it was part of an exhibit um, from the state Depe uh, def uh, public defender, and uh, you can see it, it, it was it was report... Um, Date is November 30th, but this actually happened on the 23rd. You can see it here at the top on November 23rd, and it tells uh, Kitty Scherer, uh, she uh, she conducted this interview with Bobby, and I'm going to read the statement um, on down. I asked Bobby if he could tell me what he did on October 31, 2005. Bobby stated he worked third shift, and he got home about 6.30 a.m., Bobby went to bed and slept till about 2.30 p.m. When he woke up, he did see a vehicle parked out in front of their house near the tree. The girl, Teresa, was taking photos of the van that was for sale. Bobby jumped in the shower. When he got out, of the, he, got out he looked outside and he saw Stephen walking towards Stephen's trailer. Bobby grabbed his bow, uh, Bobby grabbed his bow case and left. Bobby thought he left the house around 3 p about 3 p.m. Bobby said the girl's vehicle was still parked out in front as he drove off down the road. You know, this this there's a lot of problems here for me uh, specifically because we've got basically a 30-minute elapse in time. And typically, um, I think we've learned that about five minutes is all Teresa typically stayed at, at a photo shoot when she did these things. It's a very quick... Boom, boom, done, gone. But nonetheless, this changing of one word. When Bobby got out, he looked outside and saw Steve walking towards Steve's Steve, trailer. Exactly. So. So where all of a sudden, where, how come Teresa comes in and he says that on the stand? Who had his ear? Who was selling, who was prepping him as a witness who coaches their witnesses everybody that would be crafted yeah susan can probably say here's my <sighs> finger cues bobby if i rub under my chin you've said too much if i poke at my eye you need to say more <laughs> finger across the throat you need to shut your mouth yeah and scott oh i got you hold my beer anything you want whopping fire three three Above the garage, no problem. Well, yeah, you know, I, I'm not gonna. I could pull those, you know, these varying statements, um, which, which to me again would have been a red, a huge red flag. And I, you know, I can't imagine it wouldn't be in an evidentiary hearing. I'm, I'm thinking forward here. You know, the November 10th statement by Scott, the November 29th statement by Scott. They're, they're they vary uh, pretty widely. In one of them, he claims he was at work. The other one, he claims he was off. And went to uh, Green Bay to, to be with his mom during surgery. 
The other one, uh, he did it after work. So two pretty wildly varying statements. And I, I have a real suspicion that those interviews were recorded. They're not, we don't have any specific evidence of that, but uh, we found other instances where interviews were recorded, but there, we don't have them. Well, what would you call it, Jinx? A ledger or, or whatever showing that something got turned in? Others we do, but others we don't. Because I've asked for an interview from the DCI that was conducted uh, with Judy Stakowski, with Deb Strauss, and I don't remember the MTSO officer's name, uh, on November 6th. They didn't say, hey, nothing like that exists. They said, this is a, and I've requested this back in August. I still don't have it. Uh, an answer, but they didn't tell me they didn't have it. They said, I have to wait, basically. They got to go through blah, 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 make any redactions. Do a complete review of the case file right. again and again and again and again. <laughs> yes, I'm still waiting for the property ledgers for or the property receipts, whatever you might want to call them, the chain of custody paperwork. Right, the, the, the ledgers... All- CI records, uh, evidence that they may or may not have had or collected. So it's been four months for me. I asked for those in September. So I actually sent him a, because I have like 15 outstanding uh, requests right now from dating all the way to March or uh, September to December of last year. So I'm like, here's my, uh, you know, please give me an update on all of these. And I haven't heard back from them yet either. So yeah, I'll send a request. uh... Uh, probably 10 days ago now, asking for a status update. Now, I, haven't, I still haven't heard anything. They've not replied to it at all. It's like just ignoring me. I but do I bl- one every couple of days now because I'm just annoyed. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's annoying as hell. It's really discour- you know, It's meant to discourage. It's a delay tactic and meant to discourage us, I'm sure. But it's really annoying You know, when they're supposed to reply in a reasonable amount of time. And I, I think we've been far more than reasonable. It's really ridiculous at this point. They probably got irritated at my last request because I, you know, I, I, I think I even included a photo. Uh, I, I did the calculator thing and showed how many days it's been since I made my request, and I, you know, I don't have anything. It's not reasonable at all. And it seems like it's a lot just this case too. It's like, uh, you know, why is it this case? You know, this is a closed case. I don't understand why they need so much time to go through everything. Well, well, certainly, you know, back when many... to Uyghur, it's not. R- right. Didn't Uyghur say that it's an open investigation, open case? Well, they both say that. And and at the time, it was still in uh, in court, like... With the with the DOJ, they haven't really released anything. It was always it's an open investigation or still in litigation, right? Like because she had filed appeals and stuff, so they were they were claiming that one too. So a lot of these records requests were made before anything was filed in court again. So, that's right. That's exactly right. And, and that's what he's already saying they're going to give them to you. So there's no point for them to now turn around and go open litigation because that's a whole bunch of honky donkey door, you know, dog shit. <laughs> Yeah, the there's there's an interview of Brendan on uh, March first, two thousand six. It's on cassette that we've never heard, and I requested that. And there is absolutely no litigation towards Brendan. hasn't been for years now. And they first said, "Yeah, well, it's got to be converted," which I figured was coming. And uh, I actually think I stated that in my request. Um, and they finally replied, "said Yeah, it's got to be converted," along with a couple others. No problem. Uh, and then uh, I didn't hear anything for some good long while. I don't know what hubbub happened at Calumet County, but Amanda, she was the designated records custodian. She apparently left under whatever conditions. We don't know if she quit or got fired or whatever. We don't know. She's gone, though. She got replaced by someone else. Well, then um, I finally, you know, 90-plus days later, I get a reply from Weigert after I asked for a status update. Well, you can't have that because, well, the the Wisconsin Crime Lab is not converting cassettes to uh, to a digital format at this point in time, and that's just an unbelievable 
kind of thing he's trying to so in say. Other, in other words, they're saying the Wisconsin Crime Lab is not preserving the evidence at this current time. We are going to leave it here and sit until it's destroyed and, and it can never be played at all. <laughs> Basically. And then um, I called him out but because he also stated uh, about litigation stuff being in court, blah, blah, blah. And I challenged him because that's crap. There's absolutely no litigation towards Brendan. And then he comes back and he quotes Avery's case to me. And it has nothing to do. They said they're the ones that separated these two individuals. That's on them. That's not on us. Anyway. Hey, we got a bunch of new people chatting. Uh, well, that just shows you how biased they really are. It was never really about getting Brendan. It was always about getting Stephen. That's and right. Brendan was a, a, a tool a in which they used to get at Stephen, and and that's that's what it is, really. You know, it, it was always about Stephen. Oh, he's absolutely a pawn. Brendan was absolutely a pawn in in their chess game. There's no doubt. Hey, I wanted to say hello to. Uh, I see yoga for the ages. Ageless. I see Becca. Uh, there's TJ, Pure UK, True Crime. Uh, there's Hugh Fraser. How you doing, Hugh? Glad to see you. There's been some more. There's Maz. Anyway, uh, you know, getting back to today's filing, I. I think it's. I think it was really, uh, really well done because she she didn't pull any punches at all. She's very specific, uh, and, and in many sense, in many ways, very harsh uh, in her criticism of how the state has uh, tried to obfuscate and ignore so many so much of this other stuff. You know, it's like again, so what if Bobby had to, her car? Well, yeah, if it was Bobby and or whoever, and had her car, uh, my God. They had access to not everything, but uh, a major, the major piece of evidence, in my opinion. Yep. Hey, we lost Saprakop. He had to, he must have had to go. Doc had to go, too. Jeez, and Doc- I wonder how long it's going to take for a reply on this sucker. Ugh. Now the uh, waiting begins. Yeah, but I think they have a, only have a certain amount of time to reply, and I don't think they can just draw this out. Really? And, and I think so. I think they have a. I According think that Tracy said they have normally like sixty days is really like, but they can actually take as long as they need. And she does have a supervisor, <laughs> chief judge, that will keep up on this too to make sure that she's you know getting it done. So there's hope there. Okay, she made. What? Sakavich? Yeah, she has a superior judge. Yeah, she she said 60 days they usually take to, like, that's usually the given time. Oh. However, it could take longer, right? Like, the judge could need more time. And yeah. she could take more time if she wants to. And it's very rare that a, 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 a lawyer will poke at her and be like, we want to hear what you have to say. But she does. She said that she had a yeah. chief judge that, that is, like, over her, that watches and, like, gets updates on all the open cases she has. So she'll have to keep giving updates oh. about it. So the chief judge might, you know, be able oh. to push push her to, you know, make her choice or decision or whatever at least that's what i thought she meant oh i i was thinking it was going to be like a year <laughs> that makes me so happy well it, it it's hopeful right like but we don't know they could take like she said she could take more time than that yeah yeah tracy says yeah. that um suck at, suck at this has not got a time limit um on it oh. um yeah, she she's she's not got a time limit on it, so she could wait six months, but she's got to give. I think Tracy says monthly or weekly updates to the chief judge, and if the chief judge thinks that she's taking too long to answer it, then he can basically gear a nudge and say, right, get your arse moving and and get it done. Because like Tracy says, they're not going to want this on their books for for much longer. You know what I mean? So uh, if the chief judge feels that she's no progressing the way she should, he could gear a nudge. 
but she, Tracy's never really came across an incident like that. So it really is all oh, don't you suck at this now. She she can take as long as she wants. Yeah, but I would I, I, I would imagine in the background. I mean, we probably wouldn't hear you know, the chief judge. I think uh, in these regions, um, yeah, these various circuit court judges, there is a chief that does maintain some kind of uh, keeps an eye on things. I guess is the best way to say. It. And uh, yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, don't, I, I don't think she could. I don't think she could spread it out. Like, I don't think she could leave it until next year no. before getting a reply. Probably not. I think not. she would get a reply at least before the end of the year. I mean, that could be how long we have to wait for her to make a reply. I mean, she could make a reply in the next month, which in a way we don't want. We don't want her making a quick reply like she did the last time. I mean, KZ put in a, a, a motion and then a few days later, she denied it. Well, and in state, my opinion, I, we I, think, I, I think the state still has an option to reply if I'm right If I'm right on this. They can reply to this one. No, right? no. no. If we want Tracy was saying in chat. We're done. If we want Tracy was saying in chat. Th this is it. Okay. It's now duty. The judge. Gotcha. The state doesn't respond. Um, or can you respond to it or anything like that? That's why Kathleen made that second amendment yesterday. Yeah. And then she filed this file the day because Kathleen knows that this is it. It's now up to the judge. So the judge can take as long as she wants. And as I say, I mean, we don't want her making a quick decision. We, we don't want her coming back in the next few days or the next few weeks and say, I'm not denied. Because in my opinion, that's not her looking at it and taking everything into consideration. That's her just being on the state side and going, no, nah, I'm not even going to entertain it. Yada, yada. You know what I mean? So a few months, I, hopefully, it'll not be the end of the year. Hopefully, well, she'll well, come I'll back in a few months. Yeah, ho hopefully no more than six months. But, I, you know, I'm like you and everyone else. I want her to take the time and study what's been presented to her and not make a snap judgment just because, just because. Um, but I don't see how, I just don't see how that, given what's been presented, that she can just say denied. Because I, I think the Court of Appeals would probably reverse that. I could be wrong. They've, uh, they've been pretty harsh towards yeah, Kathleen. I can't imagine it. Uh, there's been there's too much there's too many things that need to be answered and you can only do that you can't just just blow it off that you, I mean to me you can't answer these questions without a hearing and getting people in for sworn testimony I did want to address here though Carol asked a question and it is a good one and I've never done it uh, did you ever figure out the number for that extension I'm getting the extension dialed and I'm without reading up through the chat I, I'm assuming she's talking about the seven digits that the dispatcher dialed to connect Sawinski to Singlub. I have not. There are programs yeah. out there, um, and I need to get that again from uh, Ripper. He, uh, Ripper actually gave me, I think, a couple of links to these programs that you can play the recording, and it will tell you what the number is that was called. And I've never done that. So that, that's something that uh, I probably should. Um, Why don't we just wait 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 for Singlub's line? Like, can we get the recordings for all of Singlub's line on, uh, what was it, November 6th? <laughs> and see what they say. Yeah, there you go. Well, yeah, I mean, with the, the new recordings that we got last year, I mean, he's, we've got a lot of, rec uh, several recordings of Singlub. Um, various, you know, phone conversations, not necessarily from the 6th, but other uh, other dates that were intertwined. You know, and it, that was really significant. Um, I, I think there were, I'm going to say this wrong, but I think when Zoe and yours and I put all those together, I, I think there were close to 500 telco, as it's was designated telephone calls, conversations whatever and i can't remember i did 
most of the dispatch radio transmissions, there were there were a lot. It, it was a I, remember, I just remember it was just yeah. like one upload after another. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Yeah, because I had to put my phone, I had to switch my notifications off because I was getting um, messages at like 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. Foul plays uploaded the video. Foul plays uploaded the video. <laughs> I, think we back, I think we almost killed the doc because you know, he's down there sleeping in Australia. Yeah, it's yeah. like his phone was blowing up. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Carolyn chat, she says, imagine how it feels for the boys. Yeah, exactly, Carol. I mean, we are all on tenterhooks wanting the decision and everything like that. But what the guys are going through is unimaginable. I mean, none of us can imagine what it's like for the boys because... Trapped, trapped in a cage. In my opinion, everything that comes out for Stephen's trial could benefit Brendan. I know it's no an automatic thing, and I know just because Stephen gets out... Brendan might not get out, but some of the stuff that's been revealed and everything like that, and if there's evidentiary hearing, they get it and it reveals mere, surely common sense, and I know West Constance has got fucking name, but common sense tells you if Stephen never done it, Brendan never done it. So it should help Brendan in some sort of way. And I can only i can't even imagine what goes through the guy's minds when these filings get put in especially this one for kz because this is a fucking banger in my opinion that she's put in this time and i i, I suppose they say she leaves the best till last you know um for them to be sitting there i love how that... she mentioned brandon's coercion in here yep yeah yeah Exactly, Susan, you know, so but you would think that that would also go mm -hmm. to help Brendan, you know, anything that comes through, yeah. anything new that comes out in this case. Um, that's what we would like to hope, but I would dread to think what goes through, especially Stephen, um, because it's his motions and everything like that. And the waiting time for the judge to make the decision and everything like that, I mean, I know he's probably used to it now, so he probably doesn't get as hopeful or excited or you know whatever for when these gets put when these get put in because he knows how long it takes you know and i do i honestly do feel it for steven and that as well <clears throat> yeah you know we talked about this the other day um without brendan he's the, because kratz knew he had to make this connection to or he needed something he needed something big to get them back into Avery's property because they'd already been on it so many times and multiple search warrants on that little tiny trailer and garage. They needed something pretty damn big to get them back in there on March 1st and March 2nd. And so that's exactly what they did. They went after the weakest link. Brendan just was not mentally equipped to protect himself against this onslaught that they went after him and after him. I mean, just it wasn't just March 1st. This started days earlier, days yeah. earlier against him. Yeah. That's, that one day um, they went to school, to the school, and then after school, and then Fox Hills. Go ahead. No, it's just and under none your of you, We don't have. Yeah. Under your scars is put in chat. Why did they move Stephen? Does anybody know that Stephen's been moved? He was moved a little while ago. Recently? Ago yeah, to Fox Hills. Or, he uh, went. Was that right? Fox, Fox Lake. Fox Lake. Fox Lake. Fox Lake. Me medium security, medium I think. Medium security? Yeah. yeah. No. No. Yeah, no. So that, that moved. Yeah. Well, that's, is that both Stephen and Brendan in medium security now then? That's right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Brendan's been in. He went first and then. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that after you served. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but I, I I think after you serve X amount of time and there are no incidents, they they can move you to a you know to a less secure facility, gives you more privileges and so forth and so on. Pretty sure he's been asking to be moved. The most evil man in Wisconsin. They finally, yeah. they finally granted his ask. Is what happened. Right there, you go.
Yeah, I'm not exactly. I can't remember the date, but I do remember it happening. I could probably. I, I, I don't know if I could pull up if it's on his record or not. It very well could be on Stephen's record. Um, most stuff, anything that happens significant in his case, is, I think is typically captured on his record. I, you know, actually, I'm going to pull that up. Give me just one second. He was moved, uh, or at least the post about him being moved was posted in uh, June of 2022, June 23rd, 2022. And it says, I asked Sandy about it. I said, is there a reason for this transfer, good behavior? And she said, DOC was kind enough to honor his request finally out of Max. So I guess he's been asked, he was asking, he was requesting it. So this is Stephen's compilation of record, and we see uh, the latest stuff from today. Uh, you know, and if you look at uh, this, this one here, 126 response reply, this is the one we just read. And and then there's some other papers, additional text. It says separate appendix, volume one, which um, one to uh, 167. We don't have that. And then uh, separate appendix, volume two, 168 to 323. We don't have that either. I did see that earlier. I wanted to make mention of it. So Does maybe anybody that, know what the other things that that were put on the docket yesterday meant? Uh, I don't know for sure, but leave I mean, of absence. Are you talking about that? The, the open of, uh, open of absence. I mean, the, op leave of, the second leave of uh, to amend or whatever. No, no, not granting her leave. It was before that uh, proposed order or something like that, and then there was something else. Well, there's an open records request. Don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, that was yeah. before that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a proposed order, and there was something right before that. I, my computer's not working, so I can't okay. bring it up. Only, there's the request for Stephen Avery uh, open records, and then there's the proposed order that went in after that. I, that That's you asking for the record, by the way. Susan. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yes, that's you asking for the three pages. That's what that is. That oh, Avery. okay. <laughs> but, but the proposed order, maybe uh -huh. that is, um, which is the, the proposed order is the order that probably came in on the 26th, the order to, because that was actually for the day before. Like, she doesn't actually have a leave right now to amend. That was something she filed on the 24th. So maybe it's just, it's just information, I think, like informational, like there's going to be an order coming in the next day and that's what happened. But and we should ask Tracy. So where did she go? <laughs> she went for dinner. Yeah. That's a she long dinner. Uh, Maz is asking um, if anybody knows if where Stephen's been moved to now, is it closer for Pat to get to? I can't answer that. I don't know. That would be a if, if Barb's still in chat, she Pretty she may know. The same. Jinx, you know, don't you? Uh, Fox Lake, I think, is like below the the Winnebago. I think Lake. You know what I'm talking about. I I don't think it's. I don't. I think it might be closer, closer to them, but I'm not sure. It's Fox Lake. Yeah, that's what, that's what she was asking if it was closer for Pat to be able to visit. It depends um, on I where mean, Pat Avery lives. If he's in Cribbits, that's a long drive from Cribbits to Fox Lake, probably. It, yeah. It was, I seem to Pat, recall they were pretty similar. Yeah. It, it wouldn't be as long as if he's staying in Manitowoc, you know, because it's more south than Cribbits. But... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, case 10, Susan, you're on Stephen's record, lol. You're famous. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't name you. They used to put the names. If you go back, yeah. enough, you'll see people. Oh, my God. Yep. I did have her send me the bill for $603.75 for the whole damn thing. So maybe that's what it is. <laughs> 
I think it has to do with the order that is uh that was put in today about the leave. Eh? The leave was granted. Is that what you're talking about? Right. That order came in today. Three, that was a proposed order that was supposed to be already on record, it sounds like. Tracy, you're here, so why don't you tell yeah. me what it means? Yay! Hi, Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Hope we have no good. idea. Tracy. Hi. I heard my, my name. Can you hear me? Hey, Tracy. Yeah. Thank, thanks yeah. so much for coming. Yeah, I heard my name, so I was like, oh, boy, I better jump in. I still haven't finished reading this, so I, I don't have much to say on the whole thing, unfortunately. But I heard uh, Jinx talking about the, the record, and I know we were talking about that before, and it is confusing. So the so, proposed order is them saying uh, that the order was coming in? Yeah, when Kathleen filed yesterday, she filed a leave for a second amended petition, whatever, motion, whatever. And uh, so that's mm -hmm. what the judges is. The judges now saying, yeah, that's fine. But she attached it already. So she filed the leave and she filed the amendment together. And she's because she said, I'm filing this. I'm asking for leave to file the attached motion. And so yeah. the, the judge was then like, OK, yeah, you can file it. It's a, basically she's just accepting it. So that's why it was confused. It was confusing because okay. it was called the second amended motion when we really never saw a first amended motion. <laughs> So that's why it was a little. So, confusing. what do you think of what you've read so far? Uh, I mean, it I mean, sounds I fantastic to me. It's it sounds fantastic. It always sounds fantastic. But honestly, if you're if you're on the side of him being guilty, the state's response would sound fantastic. You know, I mean, they're they're supposed to make it sound good. They're lawyers. Um, I think that yeah, the you know when it comes down to it, down to it, I said that what I said before. I don't think anything's changed. What I said the last time was that it's really down to the fact of whether. They're going to say that Swinsky's phone call is enough corroboration to prove that, you know, what he was saying. Since he never, we never actually got proof of him saying that he saw Bobby pushing the car at the time. Is hit, just the fact that we know he did call, is that enough to corroborate everything he said later? And that's going to be the biggest part of it. Well, she's saying, she's saying that that's enough for an evidentiary hearing. And it could be, but it again, it, 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 it could be, it definitely could be, but I could also see them saying it's not because they're saying he could have called for any reason. We don't know that that's what he called about, you know, so it's, it's really hard to say because the state, you know, may even made the argument that, well, even if it is Bobby pushing it, that doesn't prove he killed her. And to us, that sounds ridiculous because, well, you know, he's connected to a vehicle that was a very big piece of evidence in this case. So how can you act like it's no big deal? But when you're talking about uh, post-conviction, it is the, the standard is incredibly high. It is incredibly high to be able to overcome the bar that he has to reach in order to get a hearing and to actually end up winning, you know, on appeal. So Again, at the at the beginning of that phone call, though, Tracy, he does say he's calling up about the missing girl. Right. Which is good. It's good. Like I said it's it's good. It's just it would be better if he said, I saw Bobby Dassey pushing that car. That would be better. It, it's still not. It's the thing. The big key here is that we have to place Bobby there. Yeah. That's what yeah, has to be done. And and yeah. unfortunately, like, if, and it's weird. It's just weird that you have the first part of the call, but not the second part of the call. So it's really hard to say. To me, it sounds like, well, if you use any kind of logical thinking whatsoever, well, duh, the guy called back then. We have proof that he contacted the Innocence Project, that he tried to contact the attorneys. We have proof he contacted KZ, and he's always saying at least something similar. I know his stories have changed a little bit, but he's you know, essentially said he saw Bobby pushing this car. So that should mean, well, then obviously that's what he was calling about. But as I talked about last time, the, the courts aren't going to make assumptions. They aren't going to infer anything. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could hear them, him saying, I saw Bobby Dassey pushing that car. Yeah, yeah. but that could but be... Isn't that just the reason for an evidentiary hearing? Well, you would think, but it can also give them a reason to deny it. That's the thing. I mean, they can. They have They have a, a, a legitimate argument on why they could deny it because they don't have that. 
But what? most people would say, well, you should at least have a hearing to get more information. Put that sergeant on the stand, you know, that, that took the call and, and ask him if he remembers the call or, you know, get more information. That is what a hearing is supposed to be for. So, yes, I can say, like, yes, you should have a hearing to sort all of this out. There are way too many questions. What, but what, we've, we've, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, what, what, in, what, what impact does Sawinski's former fiance girlfriend have? Because she also swore this affidavit about basically what Sawinski said he did. She remembered it, and that was, it was definitely his voice. Well, that, that, that certainly helps because obviously that, again, just corroborates that it was him calling. And again, if you want to make any kind of logical argument, you can say, well, again, duh, what do you think he was calling about? He said the same thing for 20 years, you know, or however long it's been, you know, he said the same thing. So of course that's what he was calling about. But again, you know, it's like, I, I hate, I, I hate the fact that a judge has any reason legitimate reason whatsoever to just dismiss something. And unfortunately that little tiny thing does give her a reason. Now it could get overturned, you know, I mean, on appeal, definitely they could say that it definitely does a reason. There's a reason to order a hearing, but there's also a reason to deny it. Right. There is, even though I'm for us, curious. we look at it and think it's ridiculous to think that this guy would call and would be calling for any other reason. I'm curious, like he, like, why does he have to prove that he said Bobby back then? Because what, how would he have known back then that it was Bobby? Like, he doesn't figure out who it is until he sees Bobby. So, like, why would he have to prove that it was Bobby that he was calling about? Well, technically, I guess he wouldn't have to. He would, he would have to say something along the lines, though, of matching what he said now, that he saw two men pushing it, a younger right. man. He might not necessarily know who Bobby was at the time, but it, it, he could definitely describe him to the point where it would not be Steve. Right. Right. You know, cause, you know, so that that's the important part. So, no, he might not know him by name, but definitely if it was Bobby, he would not be describing someone that sounded like Steve. Now, the argument could be, well, and you can't even argue that it was Brendan because Brendan was gone at that point. He was already up north. Right. So you couldn't even argue yeah. that that he you know thought it was uh, Bobby, but it was Brendan. Right. Because Brendan yeah. was already gone. Yeah. yeah, he was already gone. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so there's no way he could say it, and Blaine was gone, so there's no way they could say it was one of the other boys. So, yeah, so I think that would be the most important part, that he could for sure say that it wasn't Steve, which is the most important thing. Um, I, I wanted to say... How to, much of it have you read, Tracy? Uh, I've been skimming. Uh, let me look at where I'm at here. Page 27. To, and I've I just been skimming. I haven't been reading too closely. I'm just... Kind of skimming through it. And like I said, the only thing that, you know, yeah. I, that kind of trips me up a little bit with things is just that she's re referencing a lot of stuff that was brought up on a previous appeal. But then after I was thinking about it, because I said that in the chat, I'm like, oh, I'm going to piss people off again. Because I'm going to say she's bringing up stuff that was brought up, brought up in the previous appeal. And all that stuff is dead. But but she did have the one appeal that, um, one with Bobby that they said you could, you know, with Sawinski and everything that you could bring up later. It's a matter of like all these affidavits. I couldn't remember which part of the appeal they were attached to. But uh, she showed where the same. It was the same with Romlo, that that the court told her it would have well, to be brought Ramlo, into another nine seven four six. Ramlo, I'm pretty sure was brought up in the motion for reconsideration, though. That was back when she originally filed and then she filed a motion for reconsideration after the judge ruled. I think Ramlo was brought up in that one. And I know specifically the court of appeals brought up those issues and said she could bring them up in another, um, post, you know, post-conviction petition. But I wasn't sure about like all these affidavits. She's saying that, you know, our people prove this or they said this or whatever. And I'm like, well, if that was part of the previous appeal, it, it doesn't even matter what they say. And it's all just, those are like textbook conclusory statements. Then you're just saying things like, well, they're they're not, you know, she's she's basically still giving her theory. These are just theories that were brought up on the previous appeal. But I can't remember how much of that was brought up in the motion that they decided not to rule on and how much was. That I can't remember. So I, I had she to be said Romlo was she said Romlo has never been ruled on. No, it wasn't because that was in the motion for reconsideration. It's a stuff about Bobby and these affidavits from the experts that I I'm I can't remember where those affidavits were included. If they were included on things that were already 
decided, then those affidavits don't really have any bearing on anything. If they were included on something that wasn't decided yet, then she can still bring them up. And that's the part where I was a little fuzzy on the timeline there. Because there was the motion for reconsideration, and there was the last motion she brought up before, right before they made their decision, the Court of Appeals. Those were the two things that weren't ruled on. So mm-hmm. Ramlo was definitely in the motion for reconsideration, so that I know she could bring up. Uh, but it was these other, now bringing up the thing about the cat and all this stuff. And I'm like, those are all just theories that were brought up on the previous appeal. But it's a matter of when all those things were brought up, whether they were part of the final motion that wasn't ruled on or if it was earlier in the process. Because if they were earlier and they were ruled on, then they don't have any bearing and they're not considered facts as far as the case is concerned. Yeah. Uh, uh, Susan, uh, Susan, didn't you want to ask Tracy or or Saprakov about the Naranto I think she talked about them not signing it and their reply. And so Yeah, I did want to ask her. Was it page thirty five, I think? Yeah, bottom of page thirty five. I can pull it up here. Yeah. He thought that was um pretty important. Uh which part? The bottom uh paragraph. There's a heading to it. Yeah, I'm going to pull it up. Escalano, Naranjo. Yep. Um, <laughs> here, let me get it on screen. Yeah, if you can put it on screen, that'll help. Because I'm not seeing it. Um, the state oh, waived. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. PDF 35. Yeah. It's actually, yeah. Um, okay. State waived the Escalana Narano procedural bar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the standard for procedural bar. Is that that case is the is the controlling case on procedural bar, and that's where they basically say that you um, it cannot have been filed in a previous motion. Um, there has to be um, you have to be able to prove that you could not have filed it before, or or that you had a good reason not to file it before. Or that the evidence you're presenting now is stronger than the evidence that was presented earlier. That's just it's just the controlling case for all procedural bar cases. So she's saying in this paragraph that they waived it because so it, they they didn't cite it in their uh, reply. Oh, I don't know why they I don't know why they didn't. Uh, okay. this, this, the, the, can, you, can, he, the, can they still cite it now after they haven't cited it? Because from what it sounded like, Sabrakop was asking was like now because they did not cite it, they can't. Okay, yeah, that doesn't even make any sense. I, you, you, the, the state isn't waiving anything by by not challenging it. No, I've, I've never, it, I've never heard that before yeah. because technically the state didn't even have to respond. This petition can be decided without the state even weighing in. So uh, I don't uh-huh. know how I don't know how they waive it by not challenging it. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, I guess it could be possible. I've never heard that said before because petitions are a little strange in the fact that, like I said, they don't even have to be, you don't even have to have a response. The judge could have ruled on this without even hearing from the state. It can stand on its own. So I'm, I'm not sure that, that that they are waiving an Escalana challenge by not raising it. That's an interesting argument. I I would have to look. Um, yeah. yeah I, there's more about the Escalano and Navarro further further up um before we got get to that get to this bit um they were going on about the Escalano Navarro um and I think this is just part of it but the way the whole thing read Sapper thought that this was a good point. So you might have to go back up and read what's up the yeah. top to yeah, get the context got- of what she was meaning. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get what she's saying. She's saying, well, since you didn't argue against this, clearly you must believe that this can survive Escalana. That's what her point is. I can tell you that right now just from that last part. Uh, but whether or not they were required to argue against it for it not to for the judge to rule that way, it is that doesn't matter. The judge can still say that it doesn't, it doesn't, um, yeah, the judge can still rule that it doesn't pass procedural bar. She can still rule that way whether the state argued against it or not. So it's, I mean, Casey's trying to make it sound like the state's conceding that point, but by them not raising it, they're not really conceding that point. I mean, it is a little odd that they didn't at least throw in a line that said that this doesn't, um, this this argument is procedurally barred. 
you know, but even if it wasn't, we'll argue against it anyway. Um, that's something that you would think that they would do. But her saying that they didn't challenge it does not give the judge the right to still say, no, this is procedurally barred. I don't think this is going to fall under procedural bar, to be honest. I mean, like I said, this is one argument because very clearly this information did not come to KZ until later. So I don't even, maybe that's why they didn't argue it because they, exactly. they don't, yeah, they don't believe that right. it is going to fall under procedural bar. So that might be why they didn't bother, but I don't think right. they waived the issue. I just think that, you know, they could have just decided, well, this is most definitely at least newly discovered based on, you know, the timeline yeah. and everything like that. There's really no big argument there. So maybe that's why they didn't argue against mm -hmm. it. So, you know, so Casey could just be throwing that in there. But honestly, I don't think that's going to matter one way or the other, because the judge will probably say that it's not procedurally barred because it is newly discovered based on the timeline that we know of. And even if the judge did think it was procedurally barred, whether the state argued or not, doesn't matter. The judge can still say it's procedurally barred if it's procedurally barred. So. Yeah, I thought it was, uh, I mean, not being a lawyer at all, but we've read so many documents, uh, you know, that they do cite the uh, uh, this case uh, multiple times, actually, throughout so many filings, and then it wasn't right. in the last one. It is a little weird. It just seems different because that's usually their go-to argument because they've always argued technicalities. They've always argued on technical issues. They've never argued the merits, and I think I said that at the time when the um, response came out. I said that I was surprised they were for once actually arguing the merits of a case because to this point, we have never heard them argue the merits of anything. It has always been technical arguments. You know, given what we know, just and I'm just asking for an opinion, uh, certainly, uh, you know, from your, your experiences, looking at this as a whole, let's just say that an evidentiary hearing was granted. Who do you who would you expect that they would call that KZ would want to and the state, of course, would want to call uh, to give testimony? Just in your opinion. I mean, I got my they list. Would, obviously, they call Sawinski. Obviously, um, they they would call Bobby for sure. They would call anybody that was involved in um, like the girlfriend. They would call her. They would call the um, whoever if they could track down whoever he talked to. At, at, at you know at uh sheriff's office department at manitowoc they would call anybody that could have taken that phone call or knew about that phone call um anything about that they would call them sing love um sergeant sing love yeah 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 him for sure uh and anybody else i think might have been involved like with, could have been to the person that was with him with, or with what? romlo with Romlo, would well, they call Coburn and maybe the other guy that was on duty? They could. They could. If the, the, um, if, okay, I gotta think of what I'm saying. Sorry. If the hearing is granted on those issues, but that issue will be procedurally barred. <laughs> I'm not even, there's no doubt in my mind the Ramlo issue is going to be procedurally barred. So uh, that, that will be. Hmm. that won't even be an issue. I think, so if they grant a hearing, it will be on the Swinsky issue alone. I do not think they would grant it on the Ramlow issue. Because okay. the Ramlow issue, it would be procedurally barred. I mean, that that is something, just look at the dates and you know that that's something that should have been brought up earlier. So, uh, and it just wasn't because she didn't file it in time. That's the only reason, but that's no reason to um, get past procedural bar. So, yeah. So I'm pretty sure that would be, that would be she part. did. I, th I uh, thought she did file it right after she he contacted her. Right after, but the dates on the affidavits that are included were prior to the ruling by the judge. So if they were prior to the ruling by the judge, uh, then Casey uh. could have filed them any time after the time that they were dated before the judge made the decision, and she didn't. And so that's why they'll be procedurally barred. Because she could have filed an amendment. But that was never ruled on. It wasn't, but, that, but, that, but that's I'm what they would do. Well, no, it wasn't ruled on, but when it is ruled on, it'll be procedurally barred. That's the thing. It, it, just because it wasn't ruled oh, on doesn't mean it can't okay. be procedurally barred. Yeah, so um, anything oh, on the motion for gotcha. consideration is probably going to be... I don't remember the details, but from what I remember, everything in that motion for reconsideration... I wrote a big post on it at the time that I could go back and look for that would probably clear it up more, mm -hmm. but there was a whole lot of reasons why I said everything in that motion for reconsideration would be procedurally barred. Uh, it, there was a lot of reasons, but... Um, I just can't remember all of them right offhand, but uh, but I believe it was because of the dates um, 
she was because basically she was saying these are the things that I meant to file in the amendment I was going to file, but since I didn't notify the court and the court ruled, I didn't get a chance to. Well, that kind of falls in the well, too bad <laughs> category. You know, so it, that's, so, that's, so it, that's your mistake. So, yeah. so so it doesn't necessarily have to be ruled on just because they didn't. That, that doesn't mean that well, they. The judge- the judge will still rule on it, but the judge will say that you're procedurally barred from, from that issue. That's what they'll say. Um, I, I'm surprised that she um, actually put it in there for that reason. But again, I would have to read it all. So don't don't take me as like that's absolute fact because we are talking way too far back and my brain still doesn't work right. So uh, that I can't okay. tell you the details. But she does memory, address it. Yeah. So but my memory serves right that, that, that everything in that motion for reconsideration, even though the appellate court said you it we you know that's not being ruled on you can um you can file another petition but that doesn't mean that it will be considered newly discovered and if she does address why it's considered i i can see right now she cited capsules and that part of my post that i wrote i very much remember going in depth of why capsules was not the right case to cite and why if she didn't have a leg to stand on in that mm. so um so that could be where i still stand on that but again i can't remember again brain injury yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah unfortunately yeah. i'm so i'm so real fuzzy on, on there's a lot sometimes. to remember it's a lot to remember for a normal person but when you have a problem with your brain it's a lot harder because i yeah, yeah i use i remembered stuff for like sure. four years <laughs> and then I, and then all of a sudden just like that it was all gone everything in my brain was just gone uh, and it still is that's why i uh, i'm having trouble even with just the reading this because i've already forgotten the petition and i've already forgotten the response and so i'm trying to just piece together mm-hmm. little pieces here and there and it's hard so that's why i'm like i'll come on to straighten out the docket stuff but as far as like uh, i can't i can't i can't like talk about like all the little nuance in each of these things because i just don't remember anymore so i can give very general Understood. ideas on things um but so, but so you so, so you borrowed my brain i'm kidding <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kidding no. I am doing really well overall <laughs> compared to where I was, you know, a year or even two years ago when I was really bad. I'm really good. But but unfortunately, the, the memory is one thing that's just gone forever. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to have my memory good again, but I can live with that as long as everything else is OK. I, I totally so, understand. When, when we the, still love hearing your opinion. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, I mean, you, you know, you still have a, I think, a really sharp legal uh, way to explain in a common sense uh, terms that we can understand and that that makes it so much better because a lot of times we're just grasping you know we're, we're guessing and we it's always better to get the legal somebody that knows has been around it and understands uh, what the judges are looking at what these the jurists that make these decisions will, will be looking at so we really appreciate it and I, I do the best that I can. And unfortunately, like I said, to me, I still feel like I'm I'm kind of just talking like an idiot. And last time I know somebody brought up something that I completely went blank on. Oh, and you talked about the judicial estoppel. And I was like, oh, my God, I went totally blank. And I'm like, and I felt so stupid afterwards. And I'm like, I just I was like, it's when they stop something. I'm like, That's not what it is. It's when they change their theory of the case. You know, I was like, oh, my God, I thought about it like right afterward. And I was like, oh, God, boy, I'm dumb. You know, so, so nah. I do come up with dumb things every once in a while. But. Yeah, it's in there somewhere, but they just get lost. There was something I was going to bring up that I did make note of, and now see, I've already lost it. It's in. It's about uh, Denny. I didn't love one of her citations, as usual. I, there's always some citation that she puts in there, and I'm like, why did you throw that in there? And I always get annoyed by it. Um, uh, where was it? After you look for Let's that one, I, I have another question to ask you about. Well, it was really, it was... Uh, the case, um, Burby, State versus Burby, because she brought that up uh, about the motive issue, and I like why that's not even a Denny case, and that that's just not a very strong citation. I'm not sure why she even threw it in there. It wasn't necessary. And then I was gonna read because I had to look up Denny again because I thought this was in there, and I don't know if she put this in because I haven't read the whole thing. Um, and uh, let's see. Where is the line I was Which just looking case? for? I'm just reading. I'm looking at the Denny ruling right now. Uh, and I'm trying I to. I s- citation. No, it, no, no. The Burby. It was uh, Burby. It was the case that she cited that I was. Oh, like, okay. That, that, that has nothing to do with, with Denny. And it was just an overall, like, I don't know. I just didn't like the citation. I just, mm. I, sometimes I think it's weird when she just puts random citations in there that, that make no sense. When I think she could have just used the, um, 
the wording that's in Denny itself. Uh, I can't find it. No, I've got to find it. It's in here somewhere. You guys talk amongst yourselves and I'll look for it. <laughs> well, I'll let you know and, what I find Well, it. now you go ahead and look, but you know, uh, well, we mentioned it. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but this third uh, number three section, Mr. Avery has placed uh, has pled sufficient facts to establish a violation of Brady v. Maryland. And this is about the call, the audio clip that well, that I played a few minutes ago uh, of it being, and I gave a, a timeline. So we're basically talking about from November 6th, 2005 until, I, I don't remember the date last year that we, uh, that, uh, we finally got more uh, audio clips, uh, CDs, DVDs from uh, MTSO. So it was basically buried for, let's see, 2005. So 16 and a half years, basically. These other CDs have been held. It, after being requested by multiple people multiple times, and they're saying, oh, oh it, yeah. we, we don't have it, we don't have it. And all of a sudden, oh, wait, we do have it. So this is Brady. And how do you, I mean, you know, you're looking at it from what you understand uh, from a judicial standpoint, what is it? I mean, to me, it is a Brady violation. But what do you think? Okay, so is that what you have on the screen right now? About talking about that part of the Brady violation? Yeah, this audio I, clip from Sowinski. Okay, I can't remember exactly what it was all. Oh, okay, yeah. So they were basically just saying that it's a Brady violation because it was withheld. Um. Maybe that's a that's a well yeah it's maybe it's a tough one because of all the components to Brady of uh, the first part being that it has to be potentially exculpatory without the second part of the audio you can't say that it's potentially exculpatory you know like I mean you can but so could be anything else there's not enough specific information in what we have of that call. I think to be able to say for sure that it would have been a slam dunk that it would have been something that could have been used um, to, you know, it receives benefit in the case. The other part of Brady, though, is the biggest part that's the hardest um, hurdle to overcome is that it's if, if it had been turned over, it could have potentially changed the outcome of the trial. That is the biggest component. So basically that 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 one piece has to outweigh all the other evidence that was presented at trial. And she's also talking about a cumulative effect, you know, the call in addition to these other right. other elements that could be. Well, I guess I should say, are they considered when they consider ready this yes. cumulative effect? Right. But, and that is in Kyle's that is in Kyle's versus Whitley, which I did an entire video on that on that case. And I wish I could remember everything from it because it actually was one of the, the cases that I thought was most important um, for Steve as far as the Brady violations go because of the cumulative effect. And unfortunately, I would I thought this could be something that could have helped him on the previous appeal because every but because everything was procedurally barred. We didn't even get that opportunity because when you because Kyle's does say that you can have a cumulative effect. It might not be one piece that is enough to, to, to say that, to challenge the verdict. But if you put all these pieces together, right. Is it enough to undermine confidence in the verdict, which is essentially what Kyle's is talking about. Um, it, yes, it talks about the reasonable probability probability of a different result, but it's basically saying, if you put all these pieces together, does it undermine confidence in the verdict? That's what Kyle's talks about. Yeah. And, uh, and I do think it can for sure, but I don't know of how much of a cumulative effect there is with this one piece versus everything else, because everything else has already been ruled as, um, I, I haven't gotten to this part of the, of the, um, reply. So I'm not sure what she all cited as being part of this cumulative information. Yeah. She, she actually put in several things. Uh, yeah, you can read through it, you know, when you have a chance and have a chance to let it, you know, kind of soak in and, because I know you like to do that. You like to read it and then go back and really reread it and let everything kind of hit home. Right. Right. And I, I liked it better when I could actually go and, and read all the citations and read all the controlling cases 
Um, that's where things really became clear to me. And I unfortunately can't really do that anymore. Sure. I do a little bit. Like I said, right away, I went to, to, to Burby or whatever it was and read it because that didn't sound right to me. And, uh, and so then I was like, well, why did she put that in there? So sometimes things do still stick out in my head that I'm like, okay, that case I've heard of before that doesn't sound right. But I unfortunately can't do the research like I used to, which is what I used to love to do too. So it's unfortunate. Um, I'm still looking for that Denny citation because I can't, unfortunately, you know, read this and then listen at the same time. I understand. So. Let me see if I can. <laughs> let me see. If I, can. I can't walk and chew joke, chew gum at the same time, basically. Uh, let me go back to the beginning of the document because this is going to search after. Well, I can go from here. Viable with viable third party Denny. Connected to Hallbox murder and, and planning for Evans. Let me go back here. I know Denny has mentioned she's got here on page um, it'll be PDF page four. Six. Oh. The argument for Denny is on six. PDF. Yeah, she's got applicable. This is towards the beginning of the document applicable case law and uh States Denny, the Denny standard as follows. This is way back toward the beginning. And then she has a yeah. pretty long yeah, section. Like that, yeah, and it's not the one part that I was I was reading. Um, yeah, play yeah, okay. Then it yeah, it does move into the prongs of the Denny test. This is the argument part. This is, again, back toward the beginning of the document. On It's PDF page 5. It'll be the actual document page. Uh, yeah, document. Yes, it's page 5. And she specifically cites the what the appellate court stated. See, the one part that the state relies on is the part where Denny says that evidence that simply affords a possible ground of suspicion against another person should not be admissible. So that's what the state is kind of hanging their hat on. They're saying, like, basically, just because it's a possibility that the person could be a suspect is not enough. But I think that this is a little bit more than that. Especially, and, and Casey's arguing, especially when you add it to there being a connection, a direct connection, and the opportunity. When you add them to the other prongs, it makes it a stronger, the motive then is, then kind of goes past that, just like a, a suspicion. Yeah, you know, she, she talks pretty extensively about the Billy CD as well. Oh, here, here's the part I was looking for. Gosh, it took me forever to find it. It says that relevant evidence means evidence having any tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. So basically the standard is supposed to be, and this is pursuant to state statute, it said that if to be relevant, that it basically um, has to mean that Let's see, that that they would be a suspect. The that that they would be a suspect more likely. The odds of them being a suspect were more likely with it than without it. Like if you didn't have it, then would they be a suspect? No. So that means that this, you know, like with it though, they definitely would be a suspect. So they're just saying that basically, when you're going to determine that, well, without this, would they be no? But with it, they would be. Well, that's enough to say that it's relevant. That was the part I totally screwed that up. Did that, that make any sense? Did yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you're talking about Sawinski, right? Well, no, I'm just I'm just talking about just in general Sawinski? when they're talking about when they're talking about Denny when they're satisfying the motive prong when they're oh. saying that when the state was yeah. saying that you know it just can't be someone that has you know that is a suspect and then but really what the state statute says is that relevant to be relevant, especially when it comes to the motive prong, they're saying that basically was. Like, does this information make them more likely to be one than if you didn't have this information? So if they wouldn't be a suspect without this information, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't be relevant. But if they would be because of this information, then that makes it relevant. So you can't act like, well, it's just a, a passing suspicion of something. It's more than that. It's more substantial than that. 
that's a part that I was I was gotcha. looking for. Yeah. So I know I totally like got tongue tied in there, which I tend to do lately, but um but hopefully it made sense eventually <laughs> what I was trying to say. It did. It did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see we've got Boom has joined us in chat. Hello, Boom. Thanks for coming. Now, he's got uh, a statement here. It says, uh, Bobby doesn't have to be guilty to be used uh, as a third-party suspect. And, you know, I think that's the overall theme here. Again, we sit here as we are today. No matter what Zellner has put in her filing, Bobby is innocent of anything. And thank you for saying that because I feel like <laughs> – I feel like people forget about that. And that is a big pet peeve of mine. It really is, is that we are all here because of someone being wrongfully convicted. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And I do not love when people so easily shout out accusations, especially accusations of murder um, to other people that have yeah. been not put in a court of law and had a chance to defend themselves and all that. And, and, you know, and I know I've been guilty of it, too. You watch new, the news and you see something on the news and you think, oh, that guy's guilty as hell, whatever. Hang him. Whatever you think. Because, But if there's anything in this mm -hmm. case that should have taught everybody that everything is not always as it seems and that you need to reserve judgment. So, yeah, you can say Bobby is a suspect because of all these issues, whatever you want to say. Um, and he can be used as a Denny suspect. But uh, just remember that, uh, first of all, don't call anybody a murderer. <laughs> Don't call anybody a murderer for without, you know, I mean, I just, I just, I'm friends with too many exonerees right. <laughs> that I ever want to hear anybody who has not been convicted of a murder be called a murderer. I don't even like to hear, you know, some people that are convicted to be called murderers. Um, but just remember that people are innocent until proven guilty. So I think it's okay to discuss this stuff with respect to the case and respect to, you know, like the, the, all the, Steve needs to use whatever he can to try to, to get exonerated. He has to. I, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way that it is. Um, but before you start screaming and calling someone else a murderer, you know, like, is, you know, it's okay to question things and, and discuss it and everything. But I think people get a little overzealous sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of this came up because of the, again, I because of the, the, Idaho, the Idaho 4 uh, murder case and, and this Brian uh, uh, Cop Copinger or whatever, whatever his name is, this Brian fellow. Kohlberger. Kohlberger, thank you. And you know they're they're they've already got it out the daggers, uh, no matter what. And but we have to remember, no matter what's been presented so far that we can see, he is innocent until taken to court and proven guilty in our criminal justice system. Right, and, and it's hard. It is a hard thing to do. It really it is. is, especially when there's overwhelming evidence. You know, I I I was going to school. I was in college down the street when Dahmer was captured. You know, like. I was a criminology and law student with a serial killer right down the street, you know, so I certainly understand about how hard it is sometimes to want to see someone be innocent until proven guilty, especially when it seems like the evidence is overwhelming or the evidence is overwhelming and you know they're guilty. Um, so I know that better than anybody. I have been in that case, situation, but I just, I, again, I also know too many exonerees. I'm friends with too many exonerees. I know too many people that are still in prison, like Steve fighting for the freedom and Brendan. Um, so I just, I just, hate taking it to that level so absolutely talk about other suspects do whatever but just don't don't take it to that next step of accusing people that's just right. how i feel about it well that oh yeah we have to, i mean you know if we do otherwise we're, we're just being hypocritical in my opinion we, we have to maintain right. that line of innocence exactly. we have to exactly right and that's why i don't understand why i see it so much in the in this community i see it a lot in this community and i'm like you do realize we're here because two people were not only accused but you know but a lot of it you know publicly was because people believed everything they saw and believed everything they read and and without knowing all the facts and everything and you know so i just i don't know i just like to see things you know completely adjudicated before we start calling anybody especially calling somebody a murderer <laughs> you know a rapist and a murderer I, I really don't want to say anybody called that unless uh, they've been tried and we've had all the the facts come out. So oh. there's other things you can call them that you know to be true, but other than that. So that's why I'm glad you guys said I heard you say it before, too. And I just want to say I'm really grateful that you say that because not a lot of people do. And I, I do really encourage people to remember that people are innocent until proven guilty. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. We've been here for how many years fighting for people that weren't given that same consideration? I've been had my head in this case. I do have since. a hard time. Go ahead. Sir. 
I was just going to say, I do have a hard time with law enforcement in that town <laughs> accusing them, but. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it was. There, there's, no, I there's a difference, though, when there's things that you know flat out that they've done, that it's been proven that they've done. I mean, that's one thing. And also uh, accusing yeah. somebody of, you know, one thing that's minor in comparison to rape and murder. <laughs> you know, there, there's there's a big difference there. So, yeah. So there's some things that have absolutely been, been proven. And if you want to call someone a liar because it's been proven it's a liar, I don't care if you call them a liar. You know, that's true. Mm -hmm. You know, Um but but again, I was like I just kind of draw the line at calling someone a rapist and a murderer without uh, them having a, a day in court. Yeah. That's all. But a lot of people yeah. lied on this case. It's yeah. not just like a, a little switch here with him. It's a little switch there with Dawn. A little switch with Tom Pierce. A little switcheroo right here. You know, there's a lot of little uh, nuances in in people's statements from before trial and then at trial. So yeah, I mean, people lied. That's a, that's a given. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kaboom asked a question earlier. I pinned it. Uh, how do people feel about this this filing? I mean, personally, I I think it's um, it's one of our best. It's it's really focused on uh, a few issues. Not not too many. Um, not overburdened with just a you know a ton of things that we've seen you know way in the past. Of uh, so many things getting included. It's 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 just more like her original filing uh, in this. It's far more focused and pretty laser sharp, uh, laser focused in my opinion. I'm not a lawyer. You're getting your money's worth out of that. Uh, Big Jeff and I have a uh, law firm of uh, you know <laughs> armchair lawyering, I guess you would say. But it, it seems really focused to me. Um, I hope Tracy can read through it, and you know we can talk again at a later time about how she feels about it. I know she doesn't necessarily like to give an opinion until she's really had a chance to let it sink in. So you know, anyone else yeah, that wants to give their opinion, go ahead. I, I personally, because I don't know everything Tracy knows, <laughs> thinks it sounds, I mean, it's just full of common sense and it's, it's full of stuff that we talk about all the time. And I don't know. I just, I have fingers crossed. Uh, so we have Jeffrey Forkham. He's uh, in the chat. He says, you people can't believe you could be uh, possibly wrong. Sure we can. Absolutely. Uh, it's easier to fool someone You're than convince someone, time. someone that they been fooled. Couldn't be more uh, appropriate for your efforts. Well, you know, we're, you know, Jeffrey, we're, we will follow the evidence wherever it leads. If it leads to a conclusion that uh, they've got something definite, not, not something that they just wrote in a report. You know, to write a, a police officer or multiple police officers to write a report without, and they could have easily memorialized any of this in the burn pit, and they didn't do it. You can write a report and fool a bunch of people, and that's what they did. In my opinion, this is just an opinion. Uh, why, why didn't they memorialize what they found in that in that burn pit? And they didn't do it. That's a really, really big, important thing for me if I was a jurist. It's a lie. They memorialized that guy on the bobcat, <laughs> sticking out his tongue and smiling about the whole situation. Smirking. That's exactly right. I, I would say to anybody that said that is I have spent a lot of hours on this case, not recently, but in the beginning, for sure. In the first few years, for sure. I spent a lot of hours looking at this case with the mindset that Steve was guilty just because I had to look at it from all angles. And trust me, I went through this case over and over, especially with other people. Let's look at it like he's guilty and try to make sense of it. And there's just no making sense of it with Steve being guilty. I'm sorry. There just isn't. I've tried, you know, like I said, I, I've tried to make sense of it that way. It's just to try to get some type, semblance of, of just logic to this case, trying to make it make sense. And I cannot, I cannot get past certain things. There's just, there's just certain things that just don't make sense. The burn pit is one of them. That is a big one for me. It's like, there's just no way you could ever get me to believe that Steve burned somebody in his burn pit and nobody would know about it. It's it just, it's not possible. There's no way she was killed in the way that they said that she was killed. 
my biggest problem in no general way. is to this day, after all of the investigation, everything that was done to begin with, everything KZ has done, everything all the, the web sleuths have done, everything everyone has done, we still do not know the how, where, when, why of Teresa Halbach's murder. That's she right. Disappeared. Whatever you've got. We don't know anything. Yeah. We don't know how she was killed. We don't know where she was killed. We don't know why she was killed. We don't even know when she was killed. We know she when she disappeared. That was it. Yep. And it's mind boggling that we yep. still do not know any of those things. So how anybody can say that Steve is guilty or anybody is specifically is. Well, you know, it, it's even more worrisome when you come into this case uh, again. I've been at it seven. Plus, I've been doing something towards this case since three days after the series aired. And to me, it's mind-boggling to think about even, like, again, as I mentioned, I'll just bring up the call, the phone call that we got, uh, the Sawinski phone call, plus, you know, hundreds of others, buried for 16 and a half years. Th that's mind-boggling. So what else, so what else do they have that's under lock and key that we've never seen before? There's got to be more. I believe there's more. I'll until somebody proves me otherwise, it's like, uh, you know, I know a lot of people don't do it, but, you know, it's like uh, making open records request in certain things. I requested some photographs that, um, that uh, I guess had never been requested. I don't know that. Um, of Officer Block from the Manitowoc City Police that he took on November 6, 2005. I have no idea what they are, but there were 206 or seven photographs. So I get the, a reply back from Uyghur. It's like, oh, well, the CD is the, it's degraded. We, you can't have them. You, they're not viewable. And I tried every other avenue that I, is open to us to try to get a copy of those uh, photographs. And nobody, well, either, the prosecutor won't let me have it. The men of Quark City Police said they don't have it anymore. They turned everything over. So they don't have it. Uh, haven't gotten a reply back from the DCI yet. So I, we'll see. That's another thing, this delay tactic of delaying. If it's a done deal, if this case is so strong, what's the problem? Just let us have it, and you know we'll present it, you make our opinion, and move on. But they're, they're, they're stalling, this stall tactic. It's like this cassette, uh, this or, or this recording, uh, that I'm sure, uh, I'm 99.9% .9 sure, uh, sure exists. They interviewed Jody Stokowski, this DCI, Deb Strauss, and uh, a Manitowoc uh, officer interviewed Jody in the jail at Manitowoc on November 6th. I felt that there was a recording of it. It's not listed in the report, but I think there is. And so I made that request to the DCI. That was on April 20th or whatever last year. I still don't have it. They didn't tell me they didn't have one. They just said, you got to basically got to wait. Send a review. we got to review the case. Blah, blah, blah. So why is all these things still being uh, basically hidden from the case? If you're interviewing somebody as a witness and you use that or try to use that as something as part of your case, what's the problem in uh, making that public? And they, they, there's still so much that we don't have. Um. I'm looking through the comments here. Yeah, uh, Marty H. has got a comment here. I'll pen it. I, I can't get over the whole elimination of the county coroner being called to the scene. Yeah, it, it, it really is uh, really shady, uh, you know, with state law being what it was, at least at the time. I, I suppose it still is. If there's a suspicion of death, the county coroner is, is supposed to get called to investigate, and they take over. And basically, she was run off the case and run out of the courtroom. I have It's really shady to me as well. I have to agree. It's usually the fact, Jack, that she had the power to sack the sheriff. Isn't that correct? She's but the only one in the county. Can, she, she can, She's the only one in the county that can actually arrest the sheriff. That's correct. Or at least it yeah. was. Yeah. So they're not going to have somebody that is going to no be in their club, so air quotes, you know. 
And there was a case before that the coroner done, the Ricky Hodgstetter case. And they went to her and they wanted her to do something and she refused. So they knew that they couldn't trust her. So their plan was to plant evidence on Stephen's property and everything like that. They couldn't have somebody like the coroner who could arrest them and see what they were up to. Or bring you her own. To, I mean? She would have she brought in... Know the proper people. I mean, she may not have had the skill yeah. set herself, but she would. She had the access to bring in the proper people to do a forensic uh, uh, examination. Yeah, a proper forensic examination, Jack. Yeah, with yeah. the 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 squares, you know, like the archaeological sites and that that you see, a where grid. they've got the stone and a, they mark it out, a, a grid. like that. Grid, it, yeah. grid, grid the property, yeah, or the scene. Yeah. That's exactly what she would have done, and she would have seen that there was nothing in that burn pit. Nothing. Well, you know. So, yeah, one of my biggest gripes and all with this case is the fact that she could have arrested them. Every one of them, she could have arrested. Well, and you know. They did. I think about Cuss Road, you know, and it was memorialized, but, you know, we're 500 feet in the air from State Trooper McConnell taking photos with his digital camera from a helicopter that we get to see a tarp and this uh, clandestine burial site. And we have photos from 500 feet in the air or more, whatever. Uh, why don't we have close-up photos? Where, where are the uh, on-ground photos that I'm sure I feel certain that were taken? Still don't have those. Nothing. Uh, there's, as, as Tracy said, there, there's logically, I can't make it work. I can't, you know. No. I, I guess hats off to the guilters out there that you know they're 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 um, they're, they're sure that this uh, Stephen and Brendan are where they are. I, you know, I don't know how you do it without ignoring. Plethora of other evidence. I, I can't do it. If I could, no. I would. If I could, I would. I'd move on to another case, but I can't. Yeah, the fact of missing evidence, destroying evidence, corruption in the police force, coercing a sixteen-year-old, the disabled language child. You know, they they don't scream and shout about that. But I guarantee you, if it was happening to somebody in their family, then they would stand up and take note. You know what I mean? Yep. As you say, Jack, there is nothing. I mean, especially, especially when it comes to Brendan. I've got he to laugh at the guilt words when they say that that Wayne is guilty. And I'm sorry, he's only a couple of years older than my son. So to me, he's, he, he's still a Wayne in my, uh, right. in my eyes because I think he's my son. The, the, the Wayne, you know what I mean? So that Wayne has spent more time in the jail than he did out the jail, which is wrong on all levels. And if they kind of see the way we got in Fassbender coerce that child by putting things in, in their head, who shot her in the head, Brendan? You know what I mean? If that's no feeding a child information that they're not supposed to do to get a fair you know what I mean a fair interview and stuff like that is beyond me but they keep coming ex coming up with lame excuses for these corrupt officers and it's no right I don't care who it is Stephen Brendan Fanny Adams down the road I don't care everybody is entitled to a fair shot and what they've done to Brendan is wrong and for people not to recognise that the people that are supposed to serve and protect them are corrupt and are doing these things then nothing's going to change well they're not they're not after the truth they're after a story so T1's got a, qu a random question was it uncommon for Bobby not to go up north to Cribbits seems all of the Dassey boys went without question so why did he stay at home that weekend versus others? If that was uncommon, I, I really can't answer that question. I don't. That that's more of a 
a Barb or somebody in the family question. I, I don't know. T. Good question, though. I don't know if any. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that or not. Not that I've heard. I mean, I don't think they all all of them always went to cribbits when man pa and things like that went up. Um, because Errol and that wouldn't go up, and sometimes Chucky didn't go up. You know, so maybe. Maybe some of the boys didn't go up. Maybe Brendan didn't go up all the time. You know, it's uh, just... Br Brian Zoller says Bobby said that uh, he rarely went because he had to work Sunday nights, so he wouldn't get home and go to work on time. Okay, that makes sense. He did work third, and yeah. Sunday night was his first day back, so, yeah. Yeah, but not, but not only that, Jack. If if, the, if that's when he's working, and that's when they go up there, you know, he's no maybe no going to want to go up to Cribbits when he's off work because he's wanting to go and spend it with his pals or go whatever, you know, go go hunting or whatever. Lads, yeah, go hunting things like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's any other questions I have with Tracy. Uh, there was one that popped in my mind and while I was running my mouth, and now it's gone again. Maybe it'll come back up here in a minute. If there's any other questions in chat. Uh, yeah, Yoga for the Ageless says it's very telling that the sheriff threatened to arrest her. They're talking about the, the coroner that the catch uh, to arrest her. And also that she quit before, uh, because she did not feel safe. Yeah. She left that job six months after the. Yeah. yeah it's, um, it's pretty... passive, well, pass, sorry, Jack. Passive Bear also asked at what stage can KZ run the end back over the RAV4? It's 2023. Science has moved dramatically. Could solve the whole case. Yeah, I'd like to see that impact used on the RAV uh, and, and, and other potential pieces of evidence that you know, they could pull uh, DNA out of. Um, Is that we, something KZ can ask for? Like now with this, you know, like I, for the MVAC of the, of the RAV? Well, I don't know, maybe that's, a, that's really a question for Tracy. I mean, if it, you know, let's just think about a hypothetical. And uh, Judge uh, Angie grants evidence you're hearing, and depending on what the finding of the results of that, let's just say that she wants more information and she wants, a, she wants to expand. I mean, I don't know how that works. Let's just say she grants the hearing. Uh, she's troubled by what she hears. Would she potentially order another hearing for more evidence or would that immediately go to a new trial? That's a, tra that's a Tracy question. Tracy here. We lose Tracy. Did we lose her? Uh, she can't call out what she says. Oh. She said that in the live here. Uh, got you. Her mic stopped working. Are you uh, Bluetooth? Did your batteries die? She's still in Discord, so she may just need to disconnect and reconnect. Oh, you can try that too. Sometimes that happens. Yeah, it does. Yeah, just leave and come back once and see if that helps. <clears throat> yeah, Discord, it, you know, they do updates to improve it and it causes another problem. It, it happens quite often. See a green arrow appear at the top that gives an update on mine. So, you know, generally I don't see it. I, I don't know why I don't see it on my computer, but I generally don't. But then when I open up Discord, you know, like when there's an update, it'll pop up and say uh, Discord updating and blah, blah, blah. And it does its thing. And so. now I don't even see you lighting up. Yet, Tracy, sometimes it takes a second. No, I'm not. 
Okay, I see you light up. Yeah, I saw you light up, but I don't hear anything. Am I here? No? Can there you, hear you are. Okay. Woohoo. I don't know what happened, but several times I tried to talk and then Jack just kept talking. I'm like, can they not hear me? Or is he just like cutting me off on everything I'm trying to say? <laughs> no, nope, I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't no, hear you. I figured it out pretty quick that you just couldn't hear me and I couldn't figure out why. So yeah, leaving and coming back helped, but I have no idea what happened. I just lost my mic. So anyway, I know you asked a question in there somewhere, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> So basically, it's a it's a hypothetical. So if okay. K, if, if if Judge Angie grants the hearing, uh, an evidentiary hearing, she's troubled by what she hears in that hearing. Can she? This could be a a two way question. Can she order a, yet another evidentiary hearing, expand it, get a more things examined, reexamined, blah blah blah, or would she immediately say new trial? Well, she's a judge. She can basically do whatever she wants, but she the hearing is going to be specifically on that specific issue. So I think it would be, I don't think she would expand it at all. Um, I think it would just be on that issue. And if if she thought, unless, unless she needed more information to make her decision, that's the only reason why the judge might right. ask for more information, is if she needed more information to make her decision, then she would. But just... Otherwise, just based on, based on what's in the courtroom, maybe she will make her decision on that. And then if she decides that, no, you know, obviously that 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 reaches the level of, of des, uh, deserving a new trial, then obviously then she would, you know, vacate the conviction and, and order a new trial. But but in general, no. I mean, in general, you know, it's like I said, unless she feels like she needs something to, to help her with her decision, then she's just going to let it play out. However, both sides present their case and then she'll make her decision just like a normal trial would be. So, so, but probably if, if she was troubled by what she hears in a hearing, if one happens, she doesn't like it, she would probably vacate the, the conviction and order a new trial, and then everything comes back into play. Right. Gotcha. So, so wasn't, and then my question was about um, the NVAC testing that someone was talking about in the chat here is uh, giving her the NVAC to, to, to basically do the NVAC testing on the whole RAV. Is that something that she can ask for now? Or is that, like, I remember you said something the last time you we, we, you were here about um, about the scientific testing not being asked for before the motion or something like that. So just curious if she could ask for that. If that is, if that is considered a new testing, would she be able to ask for that now? I personally think that's... Oh, God, it's tough. I, I would say that on the face, it's outside the scope of this motion. But it's pretty broad when you're talking about satisfying Denny, because there's a lot of different pieces that go together to basically satisfy that three prong test. And if you want to say do you know connect him to the to the to the rab in some other way, you could try to ask for uh, scientific testing. But I, I I really think that had to be done previously. I'm not sure that's something that can come in now. But I'm not going to say for sure no because I guess I I really don't know. Um, once a hearing's ordered, and again since Denny in general is such a broad scope, um, it's possible. But I don't think so because nothing about that is in the motion. So I, I think the motion is limited to what is in, I mean, the, the hearing will be limited to what is in the motion and nothing like that is, she's not making that request. She's not asking for it. So I, my, my quick answer would be no, but you know, I can't say definitively that it's out of the realm of possibility completely. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out then. I still think she should test the RAV. <laughs> Yeah, and, and obviously that's something that they were going to allow her to do at one time, but uh, I just feel like, in general, that could should have been something that should have been requested a previous to this motion, and, I, and I'm still not sure why it wasn't, because they were on board with doing it. The only reason it wasn't done was because the judge ruled before she had a chance to file you know, her amendment um, and, to, and to notify the court of it. So if she's going to file you know, a new motion... And the RAB is a big part of that motion. You'd think that she would have wanted to cover that base, but she didn't for whatever reason. And I'm not sure why, unless she really feels like there's nothing more of evidentiary value she can gain from it. Interesting. Um, T1 put a question in about um, the deer tag photo. 
may have been needed to prove uh, for future references that a deer was tagged under his name due to a vehicle strike versus bow or gun gun tag. It's illegal to take a deer uh, down out of its season. That's right. That's poaching and you get a lot of trouble. But it's the same that pre- reason that that Hallbox father or stepfather had to call about the deer in his field and get a tag for that as well. It wasn't it wasn't shot with a you know a bow or an arrow or a gun. It was, as far as I know, it was just a deer dying in his field, and they asked them to finish the job and give him a tag for it because you it is it has to do with poaching. I'm pretty sure. Absolutely, and you know that. It, it is really strange that that photo was taken of that deer tag. I was actually trying to th- trying to find. I've got it somewhere on my computer, but God, it's like looking for a needle in a really big haystack. It's here somewhere. I just don't remember how I've got it tagged. Um, I do question it because it is a really strange thing to take a photo of. I, I think. Um, I don't. Maybe that does explain it. You know, to say, hey, look, it was a deer strike. I mean, I'm not a car strike uh, on a on a deer. So, uh, what else we got here? Did Tracy's mic stop working again? No, I I think no. I can hear. No, okay. I'm here. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we've been we've been at it for about four hours. Are there any other questions? While we've got Tracy here before we jump out of here. Just trying to look through the chat to see if I could see anything. We still yeah, got that's cra- what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to look back on the chat, Jack, just to see. Um uh, he one says, from what I've seen, the tag occurred. On the, on the same date as the accident report, and I believe the deer has to be present when being tagged. So I would assume it was hung. It was said after. that he brought the, the deer back to the mobile the next day, which would have been yeah. on, the, on the Saturday, the 5th. But because he collected it on the 4th, it was probably backdated to when he collected it. They weren't there to give him a tag that night before or whatever. Yeah, and, and there are, yeah, he had to bring it back. He had to there, bring there, the whole deer. <laughs> there is an instant report about a deer strike. For the carcass. Yes, it, there I'm, is on Jambo Creek Road, and uh, right over there, right on the corner by his house. Is that is that an Jambo incident? Eight, is, is that in eighty eight forty four? Is that right? Or is that a different? Uh, one? I don't know. I have a I have the deer report on its own. It was you know the person who actually hit the car has a has a report on it. Not Bobby's not mentioned in it, but um, you know he had to make a claim about it because he didn't think his car was drivable, so he needs that for insurance purposes. Right, right. But it's a different. I think it's like it might be like eight eight. Oh, I don't know. I have it somewhere. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I, I hear you, uh, um, Master Cedar. I need to get alive over four years, and I'm still here. I, I got you. I feel you. He's only I'm been not... here four hours. I've been here seven years. <laughs> oh, I thought this. I read that as years. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, Jinx. Okay. Um, all right. Well, there's no other comments. I think we should wrap it up. People. Some people have to work tomorrow. I don't, but I know other people do, and it's late, it's late as hell for Alice, and it's getting late for uh, the East Coasters, and uh, not quite as late for the West Coasters, but they still have to work tomorrow. They've got things to do. So, anything else, guys, before we go? We good? You good? Thank you to everyone in chat who's uh, stuck with us this length of time and um, we appreciate your support Um, do the youtube things for us hit that like hit the subscribe switch on the bell you'll get notifications when we go live at least 30 minutes 
before we go live you'll get a notification share um tell your friends if your friends are into making a murderer tell your friends they want a breakdown on the story come to foul play point them to the foul play website all is appreciated very very much we wouldn't be able to do it without you all so thank you so much absolutely uh i definitely like to thank everyone for uh you know coming and staying in, in the chat the, the read through and uh, i really big special thank you to tracy because you know she she works too and you know she's got she's got all you know she got a real lot to deal with as well so and uh, you know she's uh she's a busy person and we really appreciate her coming and giving her her legal um uh thoughts about it because we have to do that we must do it and Again, keep in mind as you read through this uh, this uh, reply from KZ, as we see her today, everybody mentioned in that is innocent. We cannot think of, no matter what we think um, of what she's written, Bobby hasn't been to trial no, or, or accused or arrested, nothing. He's an innocent person. You have to think of it on those terms and then bring everything else into bear, into play. Have the hearing. I, I mean, to me, that's the only way we can resolve this, is to have a hearing. Hopefully, Judge Angie sees it that way as well. But anyway, big thanks to everyone. Um, I, I'm going to throw in one last thing, because I know people asked in the chat before. I know people want to know how long before um, the judge will make a decision. First off, there are no more replies, responses. This is it. Um, now it's up to the judge. And judges are supposed to try to make decisions within 60 days, but we know that that doesn't matter. Uh, I would say by summer we should have a decision. It could go 90 days, but it could even go closer to like May, even the beginning of June. But uh, hopefully sooner. I really have no way of knowing. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so that's, I know that'd be the next question everybody always has is when, when will she make a decision? And I'd say we should have something by summer, but I, probably not too much sooner than that. It'll be a few months. Yeah, I mean, she could she could easily take six months to digest she everything. Could. She's that's a lot for a circuit court judge, but um, it, it, I mean, you go way back to the original petition was filed in June. She ruled in October, right? Uh, so that's a pretty good guideline there. And that was that was a lengthy petition, lengthy. <laughs> it so was. I, I'd say I'd say within you know probably four months would be be accurate. But I, it, again, they they can they they're supposed to try to take sixty days. There is a chief judge. That her, she has to um, give a report every month about her open cases and explain like where they're at and everything and why it's taking so long. So she does answer to somebody, and uh, and so it's she's not going to drag her feet forever. And judges don't want to hang on to cases any longer than they have to. They really don't. I'm sure this judge wants to be done with this case as much as anybody, but it will take at least a few months probably. So hopefully three months, but it might be a little bit longer. Sure. Well, thank you for for imparting that because a lot of people do ask, and they'll yeah. They'll probably continue to ask us because they've missed they've missed this live. So I'll keep that uh, I'll keep that piece of information handy. So all righty, let's get on out of here. We've been at it for four hours and seventeen minutes. So with that said, again, I'd like to thank everyone for hanging around. And this has been a file play production.